call the meeting to order. Um, and so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. And uh, the, the only um, potential suggestion I, I have um, is to, we, we have a, an appointment to make um, to the uh, Community Advisory Board for the uh, Community Justice uh, Center. And we also have an appointment to make a, around uh, a parliamentarian. I kind of wonder if we should put those together, um, maybe at the end of the meeting, unless folks have objections. Is that OK? Yes, OK. okay. Yeah, is anyone here for the cab meeting? I sort of um, am suspecting not, but I could be wrong. Okay, so we'll just move that to the um, the end as well. <clears throat> All right, so um, on any other suggestions about the agenda? Okay, so with that, we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, and so we're on to the consent, oh, I'm sorry, uh, general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to make a comment uh, to the council, um, and it, particularly if it is not pertaining to anything uh, on our agenda. And if you do have a comment that you would like to make that is about our agenda, then you can uh, make that comment adjacent to that um, item when we get there. Uh, and so as uh, is true with all comments this evening, if you would say your name, uh, where you live, and um, try to keep your comments to about two minutes or less, uh, that would be great. And uh, also, if you are joining us digitally, um, just for our, um, for, for, for my sake, if you wouldn't mind changing your name to your, your first and last name so that um, we know how to uh, record you uh, properly and, and call on you properly. All right, I think that is it. Anyone wish to make a comment? Go ahead. It's hard to read with glasses and a fog. Um, and I warned you ahead of time, there's more here than two minutes. But uh, yesterday I tried to pull up the agenda and it's pulling up a February 2020 agenda. I had the city clerk verify that it wasn't anything I was doing wrong. There were two entries for a city council meeting on the calendar. You click it, it opens up a packet from 2020. Uh, it needs the recurring problem. Uh, I understand a plow hit a car last night, uh, may have you know totaled the rear end of the car and left the scene. And since we never did anything about the Green Mountain Transit folks hitting a homeless person in the crosswalk and leaving the scene, I really wonder if we've got some kind of impunity going on here. Uh, the mask police. Oh, no, the masks is coming up. I yep. can do that later. Yep. Um, public records requests uh, appealed to the head of the agency related to the Montpelier's decision to no longer be a public safety answering point. I brought that to your attention. Nothing's been done. Uh, city manager ignores appeals to the head of the agency, and that cannot be allowed. If it does end up in litigation, I will name each of the city councilors so that because you're complicit in it by not managing your manager or mismanager. Uh, the body cams, there's a rec public records request related to the body cams because that's an immediate budget item. Uh, I specifically asked for the first net proposal and for the axon proposal. Chiefs playing games with it. That I know that there's an Axon proposal because I've talked to Axon about it, you know, and you just, you let these people get so far out of accountability that you don't even know how to begin to reel it back in. Uh, I asked two counselors to try to put an agenda item on related to the public safety authority and, and related issues. Uh, it didn't get added to the agenda, but it is time critical because you've got a city manager, you got a rogue, police chief that assigned himself to run and defeat end around undermine seven years of work by the public safety authority and even resort to say oh well i'll do this and this and this and then cbpsa can be dissolved i'm like what the hell is going on here and why is the city manager saying sounds good to me let's roll with it that's a quote so i'm quite outraged that y'all are not doing your due diligence on public safety issues like radios, governance, body cams, hit and run, 
leaving the scene, et cetera, et cetera. I apologize for the tone. Uh, I'm a little worked up about it. I hope I would ask you to have some discussion around these issues and not just pass them off as if they were going in the sinkhole. Thank you. Do you want to address anything or, or no? If not, that's fine. Um, have no information on a plow hitting the street. Where, where are you getting your information? It's the first I've heard of it. Of a plow hitting a vehicle. Where, when? What's your, what, what's your, oh, if you would mind. Yeah, what's your source of information? <clears throat> Somebody who witnessed the damage. So you got it secondhand. Did you get it secondhand? Did you see it or did you get it secondhand? I have a photo if you want to see it. But you didn't see it happen. So you don't actually know if it was reported. You can try to, you know, impeach, so my, shoot my the messenger. Point, my you, point, you're, you got caught off guard. You don't know that your city hit plow. You're get, the city's on the hook for paying. No, my point is that you come in here and makes a statement that you can't back up. It may well have happened. Call I don't Officer know about Ho Ho so, Stephen, you can let him finish. Okay. Don't interrupt. Secondly, so we will follow up on that. Secondly, we have responded to your uh, request. I gave you everything we had. I told you that. Um, Which request do you with regard, don't with regard to the PSAP? I sent you. I said this is all we have. I even told you I was surprised it was all we had. Um, and I can provide copies to all the councils if you if if they don't believe me. Um, I am aware of the, body, the public records request for the body cam. Chief told me he's working on it. Um, I don't know anything about it. If agenda item, we're happy to have an agenda item with the CVPSA. Not sure what you're talking about, Rogue. We're trying to get the project done that we can get done for the best interest of our city. We've communicated with CVPSA and their chair about how we plan to proceed. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. All so, right. So we're gonna we're gonna keep oh, going. I, I, he yeah. asked me several questions. No, uh, actually, I think he asked you one question and you answered it. And, now and then he just lied to the, you. Well, so thank you, Stephen. All right. So we are. Uh, anyone else um, in the public, I, either in person or digitally? All right, Vicki, uh, Vicki Lane, go ahead. Um, oh, wait a minute. Whoops, what did I just do? We can hear you if that's helpful. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, I think I just sort of minimized you guys. Um, anyway, I... Um, I wonder if you could, if somebody there could get the public works director on the phone and find out about that. I find it really hard to conceive that a, that one of our city snowplows would have hit a car and not reported it. Now, if he hit it and didn't realize it, that's a whole different story. So that's just my comment. Okay. Uh, nothing else? Uh, no, not at this time. I just... Okay. Um, the tenor of that, of the whole, uh, it just, uh, it bothers me to hear such accusations. Mm. Yeah. Um, so freely put about. Um, anyway, so that's just my fe feeling. Thank you. Uh, anyone else, either in person or with us digitally, wish to make a comment? Okay, all right, so we are going to move on then. Um, can somebody that has the power mute me? I, <laughs> I think <laughs> someone is on it. <laughs> um, all right, so we are on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Move the consent agenda. Okay, okay motion and a second. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, so, um, and I am uh, delighted to be welcoming our legislative delegation uh, this evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I see a number of you are here. Um, so uh, I think we should probably start with uh, letting you all introduce yourselves um, to us. And then we'd love to have a, a conversation about uh, the interests of the, the city uh, at this point. So. Um, whoever would like to go first, I'll, I'll let you jump in. Go ahead, Anthony, or Senator Polina. Okay. Hi, folks. I'm Anthony Polina. I serve in the Senate 
I serve on the Government Operations Committee and the Agriculture Committee. Pleased to be here. Great. Thank you. Senator Cummings. Hi, I'm Ann Cummings. Um, familiar with your chamber. Um, one of two former mayors in the legislature right now. Uh, I chair finance um, and I serve on health and welfare. And we are looking at a very busy year this year. Yeah, and Senator Perchlick. Yeah, thank you for having us here today. I'm Andrew Perchlick in the Senate as well. I'm vice chair of transportation and also on education. Great, and I um, don't see uh, either Representative uh, Hooper or Kitzmiller at this point, unless I'm wrong. Let's see. Okay. Um, so yeah, actually, for at this point, I want to turn it over to the folks who um, uh, put together, I guess, our our uh, legislative agenda. So um, Lauren or uh, Connor, would you be up for for talking us through this? Yeah, sure. Okay. I, I can kick it off here and uh, like to re really thank the senators for coming in. It's uh, I think it's it's the third time we've done this now, and it's it's really just great to you know sort of have you so receptive to our uh, recommendations, and it really does feel like you have your thumb on the pulse of the city. Uh, just coming to these meetings, um, you know, sitting through and hearing everything we're dealing with. Uh, so really, just want to start off uh, appreciating the three of you for coming tonight. Um, you know, I, I'm sure everybody's had a chance to look at the legislative agenda, and I think maybe it would be helpful if. I know we all have sort of our different uh, points of interest here. Um, maybe we could chime in on some of those. Uh, but I, I serve as the uh, city council liaison to the homelessness task force in town. And uh, as, as you know, um, we, we've seen, I'm not sure if it's an increase, but definitely an increase in need, I think, in the services uh, that the city's provided. And, you know, it feels like we're, doing the best we can uh, with sort of a $14 million budget. But as time goes on, and Ken Russell will talk about it when he gives his homelessness task force presentation, um, it feels like we're increasingly maybe taking on some of the roles that the state traditionally has done there. Um, you know, certainly we, we have a social worker that we've embedded into the police department along with Barry. Um, we, we recently appropriated funds for a, a second uh, peer outreach person. Um, We've expanded the hours of the transit center to make sure people can be warm, um, you know, before they're able to go into the shelters. Uh, we put money for transportation and um, and seventy five hundred dollars for hotel vouchers as well. Um, so we're, we're doing the best we can, but sometimes it still feels like we're underwater on some of these issues. We've got the ARPA fund set aside for four hundred twenty five dollars to explore maybe you know twenty four seven restrooms as well as sort of a, a hub where people can go get out of the cold and stay warm. So I, I think there is like, a, you know, if we, when we did our strategic planning, there, there is a willingness to continue doing this. Um, but I, I think we need more help. Um, the big thing that comes to mind, and it's on the agenda, is, uh, you know, the public restroom. It's been a discussion for a while. We did meet with the BGS commissioner and um, I, I think there is a feeling that, you know, in addition to the community, 24-7 uh, restrooms really are necessary for the dignity of folks just to be able to you know, take a shower, uh, maybe a laundry unit in there too, if there was a component of that. Um, but we'd love to see something like that in the capital bill, maybe to share some of this expense. You know, the state does uh, maintain restrooms off the highway, right? Uh, and we have thousands of visitors every year to the state house and looking at some of the uh, state, state uh, attractions in Montpelier. Um, so that's one thing we'd really love to partner on. Um, so just want to put that on your radar and see if there was, I, I don't know if there's any reactions to that or maybe we should move on to another issue there. Um, we can keep going. Uh, would Lauren like to talk about PFAS a bit maybe? It's <laughs> another one hot off the press. Sure, yes. And just echo the gratitude for having you here. Um, it's really great to just keep in touch and be able to hear from you all um, what you're what you're hearing um, and how we can partner on these priorities. Uh, so um, 
a couple that are kind of in my wheelhouse. So, you know, as you know, we've been really wrestling as the only community remaining in Vermont who's taking the PFAS contaminated leachate. Um, so, you know, we're viewing it as high priority both to continue with upstream solutions like you all have of banning PFAS from additional products. So we're not importing them into the state and continuing to look at solutions to protect our um, our water and our environment and our people um, from these chemicals, um, you know, even looking at things like possible, um, you know, in the infrastructure bill, for example, there was funding for PFAS contamination in wastewater treatment facilities. So maybe there's some opportunity there um, that we could explore about, um, you know, better filtration at our own uh, facility here in town. So some of that just want to kind of keep an eye on what opportunities you all might see in the legislature from the state funding that will come in um, either ARPA or the infrastructure bill. Um, another one kind of up my wheelhouse, um, you know, we put, we've been, uh, of course, advocating for uh, strong action on climate change mitigation and uh, resilience, um, you know, working towards our city's net zero um, target that we set um, by 2030 um, for city operations and then 2050 for um, the city overall. And so, you know, we know that'll be a big topic of conversation. So, you know, looking for opportunities where the city might be able to um, partner in, benefit from, you know, the things like the the My Ride pilot, you know, if there's ways that I think the city could be a leader in benefiting from um, the, the climate investments that I know are going to be, you know, on you all's uh, to do list this year, it would be great to just keep in touch on, um, you know, where you see opportunities for the city in that. Thanks. Lauren, Lauren. Yeah, yes. I don't want to, I don't want to take us off on a tangent or anything, but you mentioned that Montpelier is one of, is the last place to take the PFAS contaminants. Yes. Um, can you just tell me, how'd that come about? I mean, why is that? Why, why are we, we the lucky ones in that sense? <laughs> do you want to answer that? Or I, I, can, I can take a stab. Yeah, go for it. Can, um, <laughs> so, I mean, so historically, there have been, you know, we had learned, you know, maybe like five communities that have taken leachate. And for, it sounds like a variety of reasons, every other um, facility in Vermont has stopped taking it. So at this point, the Coventry landfill, and we get some from uh, the closed Moortown landfill as well. Um, but most other, they're either shipping it to New Hampshire, New York, or Montpelier now. Um, and so we've been working with the state, um, trying to look at how um, Casella can, there's a permit process underway where they're looking at pretreatment of the leachate um, before it would go to any facility. Um, and so we're trying to kind of ensure that stays on track so that no community, including Montpelier, um, in the future, once that gets up and running, um, is taking the, the PFAS contaminated leachate and just essentially dumping it into the river, but that's going to take, you know, a year and a half or so. We were told to get that up the pretreatment up and running. But could, Mon could, Montpelier the could Montpelier theoretically say we're not taking it anymore? Yeah. We theoretically could, yes. And we've been wrestling with that. Yeah. Sure. And there's so there's an ANR uh, program that uh, allows um, some oversight of of this uh, pretreatment and as far and correct me if I'm wrong Lauren but uh, my understanding is that um, ANR's involvement is that at least is a, um, tied to uh, it going anywhere in Vermont um, so in order to sort of have our, ourselves and ANR continue to be at the table um, there that's um, something that we were interested in but but that could change um, and we've sort of set a deadline for ourselves to to check in to see like are they making progress and is you know is this really happening or are people dragging their feet etc oh, yeah please yeah. yeah if i may senator um you know the, the the fact is whether montpelier takes it or not the leachate is still being generated because of trash that we all generate um sure. not, and pfas is in many many substances so vermont still has a huge issue with this it's got to be disposed of somewhere and um, and so I think the urging here is to provide the funding and the leadership to make sure that the, the proper that that A and R stays on top of this, and that there's adequate resources to make sure that state of the art treatment can be developed, so that uh, we can all 
go forward. And obviously right. that we also ban this the topic, the substance in any new products coming in. Right. Um, so I think, you know, it's we're taking it because someone has to and, and we are being compensated for it. But that doesn't mean, you know, we're, we're the only game in town. So someone's got to deal with this. Right. Thank you. I'm just, yeah, go ahead, Connor. Keep thinking a few issues here. Um, I mean, a big one for us, obviously, as you know, is uh, state employees returning to work. And I think how much how much influence the legislature has over a decision like that. Uh, you, you might not be, you might not be <laughs> pulling the trigger on that, uh, but anything you can do to influence it. You know, we still see the tumbleweeds rolling around town sometimes. And, uh, you know, between the lost revenue of parking and just the fact that people aren't buying sandwiches at lunchtime, uh, has such a, a real and immediate effect on uh, the economy in town that we're we're still still pulling back from and uh, probably will continue to be for a while. Um, an issue uh, Lauren mentioned it, but I, th I think it's important to give feedback when a state initiative is going really well too. And uh, my ride, I believe, uh, it has been a success in our community. Uh, thanks, Senator Perchlick, for your leadership and transportation on that. Having sort of the city-run Uber, um, you hear the different stories about people. Uh, you know, whether it be with disabilities or seniors whose world has been expanded by having this on demand transit system. Um, and we would really like to see that expanded even. I know AOT is looking to roll this out in other communities, but we don't really feel like we're at the point where we've done it right yet. Um, so put more resources to have more drivers, more shifts, and expanding the service area, I, I think would make a big difference in a lot of people's lives there. And we're certainly willing to commit, I think we're putting 70K towards. Uh, GMPR budget again this year, so we're, we're happy to do that. Great. So we're going to. Um, I want to give the opportunity to our, our senators to either, you know, tell us about what what you think about these topics that we've just raised, or are there other big issues that we have not raised that you think are going to be um, moving this legislative session uh, that we should be paying attention to? So. Um, yeah, whenever you're whenever you're ready. Senator Cummings, go ahead. Yeah, I'll start. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I'm, I'd like to start out by commending Montpelier for really being a socially responsible and caring community, you know, that you're trying um, to, to do everything possible with the homeless, the bathroom was news to me, and I, I think that's great. It is difficult um, with young kids, and um, we could use a public restroom. I, if the governor puts together the capital budget, um, we can talk to the, um, the committee and see if we can get some money in there. Right now, we have a lot of one-time money. The problem is our base revenues at this point are not projected to increase any faster than our expenses. And I doubt that that's novel. Uh, my experience with the city of Montpelier says it is always tight. And so we're trying to do wise investments, but not make a commitment for ongoing, i.e. staffing kinds of things, because if we do that in the future, um, we are, uh, we're gonna have to take it from another, um, another, another program. One I'm particularly concerned about, we have two programs that because of our revenue and expense thing have suffered for years and the pandemic has brought out even greater need is our mental health system and our long-term care uh, visiting nurse visiting nurse home health um, we need to look at our medicaid rates that we reimburse them uh, with because uh, this the pandemic has really brought that out um, we don't control when workers are coming back. I was polled again this week about whether or not, you know, how I feel about the legislature coming back. We're all watching those numbers. Um, I think 
up until Omicron and the last couple of weeks, I was certain we were going back, probably masked. Um, I'm not so certain now. And I think state employees are in the same predicament. We're trying to get everything back to normal um, as quickly as possible. And at the same time, protect the health of our employees and the, and the people of Vermont. And I think you know how controversial masking is, never mind vaccine mandates or uh, mandated testing. So um, we're working our way through that. Uh, we've got a couple, this is the second year of a biennium and I have never seen so many heavy issues on our plate in a second year. Uh, we have the school waiting study uh, that's going to impact yes, no, and maybe, um, you know, different schools differently. We have the pension issue and the pension expenses, not payment for what we didn't put in in the past, but present payment expenses are in the, pro in the ed fund. And while this year we have a significant surplus because of the federal stimulus and the fact that people went out and bought a lot of stuff, but the cost last year just for the undervaluation on the return and investment went from 6 million to 36 million. And if teachers healthcare goes in, which the Senate has done, the house has still not made a final decision. That's another six, 8 million. Any increased payment from the state to the pension fund is of the teacher's pension fund, not state employees, is going to be footed by the property tax. And I think city people have always been very aware of the burden of the property tax. Um, we're gonna be looking at that. We've got a couple proposals of going to an income tax and um, we're gonna be looking at that. I assume this year we're gonna try um, but again, it's the second year and it's just the time we're going to have, uh, but they're all issues we're going to have to deal with. Um, we're putting as much money as we possibly can into affordable housing. We've got all kinds of federal money, um, but it takes time to permit and build housing. Um, and that you know, we're, we're sitting here trying to make do in the middle while we're trying to build our way out. And um, hopefully we can. The thing that we're missing, or we will be missing, is a great deal of ongoing state revenue to fund the services necessary for a lot of people to work their way out of homelessness. And that to me is, is critical. Um, I think we know that many people have mental health and have addiction in, you know, issues. And if we're going to truly change the situation, we need to find the services that they need to help them um, not just get into temporary housing, but to get into permanent housing and um, lead, you know, a comfortable and productive life. So I think that's it. It's, it's fairly overwhelming this year. Um, the things that we've got to work on. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Well, I would, I would just, <laughs> I ahead. could easily just ditto everything and 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 just said um, she laid it out pretty well the challenges that we face. I would just mention two other things that should be on her list as well. But it's one is going to take a lot of our energy, whether or not it changes anything or not. But it's going to affect all of us as the debate over reapportionment. Yep. redistricting as you know the um the the in the board of re reapportionment board came back calling for single member districts for both the house and the senate so that'll be that, that'll be a time suck quite honestly in the legislature because there'll be a lot of internal debate about that particularly in the house maybe less so in the senate we'll see how that goes but i think that um 
that's going to something that's going to take a bunch of our time, whether we like it or not. We're also going to have to early in the session decide how we're going to deal with COVID from the statewide point of view again. Um, you know, turn to mm -hmm. town meeting day, town meeting um, exemptions from have doing in in, in, uh, in person meetings and whatnot. Those things that we did last year, we'll have to decide if we're going to do them again this year. That will happen pretty quick in terms of the beginning of the session. Um, I think that, you know, one thing I want to mention is we've talked in the past with you folks about the importance of supporting local initiatives. Um, I'm curious, this is, I don't want to go off on a tangent either, but I'm curious where your take is on the non-citizen non voting issue at this point. But what I wanted to say was that, you know, we we continue to try to find ways to give more power to local communities from the government operations committee point of view. You know, we the one time when we actually did it was the, in giving you the, the make giving you the option of doing mask mandates or not. You know, so the one time we decided to give you local control was was a tricky issue that all of us know is very controversial. So it's just kind of interesting that we decided to use put that one off on you folks as because as opposed to doing a statewide mandate for masks. I appreciate the fact that Montpelier has been doing it itself. So I, anyway, <laughs> I just think that the, between the pensions and the reapportionment and the potential of talking about education funding as well, um, it's an ongoing discussion around moving to, away from property towards income that will, I don't think we'll resolve that this year, but I think we'll get the conversation going again. Um, John, do you want to speak at all to the um, uh, non-citizen voting? If not, that's fine. Yeah, I know it's an issue we've already kind of dealt with, right? It's in the courts. I don't want to. I don't want to distract us from talking about things that we need to really talk oh. about. But I'm just curious. Fair enough. Let's let's keep going for now. But um, if you want to weigh in on that later, that's fine. Um, Senator Perslick, anything you want to add? Yeah, I was going to bring up the waiting study as, as something that was not on your on your agenda. I can see why it wouldn't be on your priority list, but it's definitely some a big thing that's going to come up and I know you're not the school board, but it, the two different recommendations coming out of the task force, if you looked at the charts in the back, either, either way, either option would create a tax increase for the property owners of Montpelier. So it's something to just be aware of. It would be phased in over five years. That was the recommendation. Um, but it's sure it's going to impact all the citizens of the city. So it's something to at least have on your radar and be involved with as much as you can. And in discussions with the school board, I think would be good. Uh, but I support the, when I looked through your agenda, there's nothing on there that I had questions about or wondered what your thinking was or anything. I think it's great. And I commend you for doing the work. I also looked at your strategic plan. I thought that was well done and was glad to see the city government doing that kind of planning. I thought that was commendable and happy to help where I can on the, on the bathrooms with the capital budget and working with BGS. Uh, hopefully we could, you know, find a location that they could support. And, and this, if it's going to happen, this is probably the year to find some extra money to, to make it happen. So probably working with representative Hooper would be good to try to find a way to, to make that work. And just one other thing I'll just mention that I'd like to see the city do is my, I have a son that goes to college in Ithaca, New York, and I have a daughter that goes to college in New York City. And both of those cities passed bans on interconnecting natural gas. Uh, but for, you know, for Montpelier it would be propane, but they, if you build a new building in, in either of those cities, uh, you can't do gas stoves or hot water heaters. And I think that it would be interesting if um, Montpelier was to look at that and how the state could be supportive. Because I know there's going to be an impact on low income folks, possibly. And it wouldn't be existing. It's only for new stuff. So it would be something that I'd be interested in seeing how the state could help a pilot, sort of the way we did with the on demand transit, which I agree with Connor's comments that it's not perfect yet. And if we could get some more money for that before we start rolling it out in other places, I, uh, I'm going to work for that as well. But something else just to, not to put the uh, task back on you when you guys are asking us to help, but that would be my uh, comment. <laughs> um, Senator Perslick, I would love to connect with you about um, that last point, um, and particularly with the Energy Committee. Um, so 
Anyway, let's be in touch about that. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, can I just follow up briefly to S Senator Cummings? And we were talking about the state employees, and we I, I, certainly the city government is not suggesting that we put anyone in harm's way. And, right. and if Omicron is coming. I'm sorry, uh, Bill. I'm going to ask him to turn you off. Okay. I'm, I'm apparently. <laughs> it's not just I'm, you. I'm, so, so we don't want to obviously put state employees at risk, and we, we have our own city employees. I think the concern here is um, prior to us hearing about Omicron, we were getting word that um, the state was looking at permanent changes where there would be less employees in Montpelier and other downtowns for that matter, that uh, there would be more remote work, that, that they would be reducing their footprint. So obviously, at, at Times of high emergency, we're not suggesting that we right. okay. we do anything. But I think, in, in terms of longer term structural, I think um, you know, for lots of reasons, it's great to have our employees where where people can find them and, and get to them. Any other thoughts or comments? No. Okay. Uh, Lauren, yeah, go ahead. Just just one thought on the. Um, idea that Senator Perchlick brought forward. Definitely also look forward to exploring it with you. I know there have been some conversations um, with BHCB and others about the affordable housing investments that we're making and are we building those and are there kind of co-investments we could make that are ensuring that we're not building things now that are then going to need to be retrofitted to meet our own state climate commitments in a few years. So, you know, can we get those so they're efficient and affordable and, you know, healthier, like we know that, you know, good weatherization and good clean heating sources and stuff can do. So I, I know that conversation is happening some, but it would be great if you could kind of keep in ears out for that as well and look for opportunities to make those investments really good for both the uh, people who'd be living in them and, you know, meeting our state obligations on clean energy. Thanks. Any other? Uh, comments um, from our senators. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. Um, we really appreciate uh, your time and willingness to hear us. And uh, gosh, I uh, hope you uh, have an excellent upcoming session. Uh, hope it all goes well. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Contact thank us you. anytime. And in the same. Thank you. Reach out anytime. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Be well. Yes, you also. Okay. I, I hope oh, yes, the senators uh, would see that we can be a resource for you when you see bills coming up. If, I hope we have the exchange in both directions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fair enough. Uh, all right. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, quickly, before we go on to the next item, I just want to report that at 3.45 a.m., a grader did hit a car. It was promptly reported to the police department. The owner of the car was found. Insurance information was exchanged, and no police report was necessary. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right. So, okay, we are, we were, are, uh, for now, skipping the uh, appointment to the um, community advisory board, and... Um, all right, so we're on to discussing uh, an amendment or some amendments to our mask mandate. Uh, and for this, I know some of it is coming from staff. Do you want to explain it? I mean, we I can <laughs> jump sure. in too. Go ahead. Well, so um, I, when we did the mask mandate uh, at the last meeting, we actually adopted two things. One was the policy for city employees and the other was the general mask mandate and both important. And I want to be clear, this isn't our, our proposed uh, suggestion here isn't necessarily just for city employees. Um, I think we, we talked about, you know, the, and we may want to find the, the right language even tonight, but the idea that, you know, someone's alone or whatever, it, it, if, if, you, if you look at our mandate at the most strict reading of it, a, a person that owns a business could have an office in the back of the building or upstairs and be sitting alone in their office, not with the public, not with other employees, and technically would still be mandated to wear that. And in, in the policy we adopted for city employees was that if you're alone and working in your office or if you're isolated from the building, you don't have to wear your mask. Obviously, when you're interacting with the public, you do, or if you're with other employees within a certain distance. And we took the mandate 
the, the citywide mandate just said must wear indoors all the time. And I don't think that was people's intent necessarily. And so we're just suggesting that we tweak that language somehow. We took a stab, uh, Cameron took a look at other mandates in the state and just tried to use the language they were using, um, but we're, we don't have any pride of authorship there. If, uh, if there's something else that people want to use, that's fine. Uh, but we do feel for, for lots of people that that would be an appropriate remedy to, to change the language. And uh, if I can also call it out, one of the other things that has at least been suggested uh, is the possibility of adding some kind of enforcement. And you all are not necessarily recommending that at this point. Um, no, uh, we, we have, um, you know, the, the good and the bad of this, this legislation is that we have to look at this again in 45 days to renew it, and then at 30 day increments after that. So we'll have, I think our recommendation is to let the first 45 days run and evaluate it at that time and see how it's going, decide what we want to do. We do have the section that people will be noticed and we have sent out notices to, to witnesses and confirm non-compliance and ask them to step it up. So we'll see how that goes. Um, questions. And then, so we'll do questions, and we'll hear from the public, and then we'll go back to our discussion. But questions at this point, yes. Well, uh, I think I, I agree with the approach of maybe waiting the forty-five days to, you know, uh, come out with uh, different penalties. But uh, could you give us an idea of how many complaints we've received? Though? I don't have an exact number, but they've mostly been uh, concentrated around a couple of businesses, uh, and, and then you know, much smaller one or some others. Thanks. Any other questions at this point? Okay. Uh, all right. So I do want to uh, go to the public first, and we'll start with anybody in person. Uh, Steve Whitaker. Um, I I wonder if folks, counselors, are even aware that of the tactics of like fear and intimidation. We're going to send you a certified letter, and we're going to threaten you as if you're supposed to be. A business owner is supposed to be a deputized police. It, the business owners are required to wear masks and their employees. They're not required to enforce it upon their customers. They can put the mask on the door. That's what the, th the letter says. But I mean, the sign on the door and let people know. But to, you know, suggest that teenage, you know, first job, 16 year old employees of Shaw's are supposed to chase adults around the room and insist they put on a mask is absurd, you know, and certified letters, you know, that are, are bluff. They're really a bluff. The, the, the business owners have no obligation to cite or reprimand or kick people out of their business for not wearing a mask. They could point to the sign. They could say that this is a city ordinance, but that's it. So for us to be wasting money on certified letters, you know, and, and, Creating fear and intimidation, insinuation, coercion is just out, out of hand. I, I warned you about it last time, and it's it's more mismanagement, you know, by the city. Thank you. Go ahead. Greetings. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Ooh, I'm a little short. Uh, my name is Carrie Kelly. Uh, I'm one of your homeless population currently living over there in the shelter. I just want to make you guys aware of a couple of things that are of issue at this point. Um, another way right now is um, denying services of any kind uh, to me and to others that are not issuing them a COVID vaccination card, uh, proof, full vaccination, which I did not know was uh, legal. And as per listed here actually by the CDC, it says, do not require a negative COVID-19 viral test or proof of vaccination for entry to any homeless services site of any kind, unless it's posted somewhere. Do you have such a local or state uh, ordinance or anything like that, that mm -hmm. I should be denied repeated services no of city, food, clothing, or no telephone? City, the only city related city regulation is the requirement that masks be worn indoors in public places. 
Okay. That's and then threat and of law enforcement that. being called on me if I want to use a phone to get housing? There's nothing about that. Nothing that we have. Uh, okay. Again, I don't know if the state does, the state health department. I've not heard of anything. Okay. I just wanted to make you aware of that. And then just a couple of issues with the current shelter. Are you aware that women are being housed with men? And then I am forced to sleep next to men. I've been asked to undress in front of men, that I've had comments about my vagina by men. I've been threatened to be assaulted by men for spraying Lysol because I am at high risk and disabled. I have a respiratory issue. Um, I can prove it through my disability as well. And when I spray Lysol, I'm like been physically threatened for a week now. People are coughing continually all night long. Um, so there's drug use in the facility. Um, I've even had to go to the point where I literally just had like a little memo recorder. I can play at some point how physical it almost did get, or I was almost actually hit by a man because I sprayed Lysol in on my bunk to protect myself. I don't need to die of COVID. Um, I had a shoe thrown at me this morning for spraying Lysol after the entire room was coughing. I've had my inhaler stolen by an employee over at the shelter as well. While I was sleeping, he opened my bag and then mocked me and said, if I have things to say about people that are sex offenders, that I deserve to have my life-saving medication taken from me and that my attitude is uh, something that deserves possibly a penalty of death because without that inhaler, I can die. I'm also still having bad respiratory symptoms. I'm sorry, I don't mean to bring anyone down. And also there's an issue with the ventilation in there as well. I don't know if it's just an education issue, but the filter is not working. The smell in there is ungodly. Had the filter be, been working, and I've also worked in healthcare for 30 plus years, I kind of know how filter works. Um, there would be no smell in that room. Uh, there is also no open ventilation. They have sealed all of the windows now. That is also an issue. I'm concerned because the same people that are sleeping in that room are all sharing needles and drugs out in the public, going into your restrooms, sharing your shopping facilities with you, touching the same items that you are. They're not washing, they're not caring for themselves. Uh, they're going to your bus station. We also have an issue with bathing. There's not enough facilities there to bathe. There is no shower, but if there are too many people there, sometimes you have to be in there to bathe when you are outside. It takes a little longer than five minutes to wash up. Um, I may work a little harder at cleanliness than others, but it is not an excuse. And also our beddings are not being washed. I wash my own. Um, we were treated poorly at the laundromat, told that people hate the homeless and don't want to be near us in the laundromat. So it may be deterring some of the people I'm staying with that are in crisis from drug abuse and other issues, um, from washing and caring for themselves. But also another way is denying our entry into their facility, which would be the only shower that we have at this point in time. So being that Omicron has emerged, I do not want to see the entire community sick. I mean, we are out every day. We are con continually out from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. From 8 to 10, we have nowhere to go. Um, we wander around. At some point, somebody will die of exposure. Um, we also have a lack of warming stations from 5.30 to 8 p.m. I am, for some reason, trespassed from the bus station. The police will pull me out of there. I can't even stand in there to stay warm. And that is the only other option that we have. I'm not allowed to get on a bus. This has been illegal. I've been going through this since, uh, what, June? I've had a lawyer, but they continually take me off. Um, whether I literally have to take my tablet out and record them for my safety so I don't get injured, but I should have someplace warm to go. I was illegally locked out, dead bolted out of my hotel room at the Pierre and Barry. The only reason why I'm alive is because my friend happened to be there. I had a BLM sign on my door, which was not favorable to police because I find it insane that anyone is killing people because of the color of their skin or anything else. And if I'm somewhat of an activist, that is my prerogative and I don't deserve to die of exposure. 
this is now time three where the police have trespassed me in such a way that I've lost my house. The first time when they trespassed me from the transportation, I was staying at the Good Sam, which made me lose my housing, and I lived on your streets for over a month when they would not let me use a phone, make any calls, or even find the social worker who found me by accident and got me housing. So here I am, just to let you know, and being denied entry into the Econo Lodge, which has hundreds of rooms, along with the other people I'm being housed with. So I just wanted to ask you if you could look and see why none of us can fit into a hundred plus room motel. The same amount of people that have always been here were here before. And I would have frozen in Barrie had my friend not brought me to a rest stop to keep warm. And I cannot stay with my friend because she has public housing and she will lose her housing. So I'm in this limbo. <laughs> So if anyone could help, <laughs> and I'm not the only high risk person at the shelter, I'm not gonna give names. We don't all love each other. And it's hard to do it when you have that many people in a room and we all are desperate to have some control over our lives and we will fight. And people do get violent. Some are more violent than others. I'm not, but I do not wanna be injured, but I don't wanna see other people in crisis. And I certainly do not want anybody else to freeze outside. And the only option I see at this point, to be honest, and this big messy stack of papers I carry around, um, <laughs> is that we should just be housed separately so we can remove ourselves from this level of crisis, all of us independently, and let us return back to our normal state of sanity. Let us be safe. Let us be warm. Let us get better. Let us be better. And then we can be a better part of your community. And also, I'd like you all to be safe from Omicron. <laughs> I'm just having a bad asthma. So it's, it's okay. Can so anyway, I just my full long statement. <laughs> that's okay. So I have a, a few thoughts. Um, so thank you. Um, Shall I exit? Sure, yes, you can go ahead <laughs> yeah. and sit. Thank you. Um, so uh, so so one thing. Um, so right now, um, we are uh taking comments about our mask mandate but i but your comment is i, I let you you know c c carry on even though it was not about the mask mandate because um for, i think you missed the general business and appearances which is at the beginning yeah, um and so that's fine so um it's okay so anyway so i figured that that would be all right to let you you know um sit, you know continue on and then also i just want to point out we are going to be talking more about um uh homelessness uh actually at our at the next the very next item so anyway i, I will take your comments also as pertinent to to that topic as well is that okay yeah. okay great thank you um, but I do want to return to talking specifically about um, the, the mask mandate. Um, and for that, anyone else in person about the mask mandate particularly? Okay. Um, all right, but I do see your hand. Vicki Lane, go ahead. Um, I'm not, I just didn't, I, it's not about the mask mandate. Well, I just wanted if, to let you know, um, I can't hear especially Bill. Okay, good to know. That's Thank you. Okay, that's fine. No worries. Um, any other comments from folks online about this? Okay. All right. So back to the council. What are your thoughts on a potential amendment? Go ahead, Jack. I think this is a good idea. I think that uh, one of as I reviewed this, you know, one of the thoughts I have is that uh, alone in a public building might be interpreted to simply mean you're the only person in the building, whereas I think we also want to let people know that if if you're in a public building, but like you're in your own office, that alone in your own office, that should also be uh, covered by this exemption. Do you have any thoughts as to how we can make that clearer? Well, <laughs> if not, that's you know, <laughs> I started writing something and I just looked on my computer and it's not there. But 
something like any person who is in alone in a public building or alone in a room in a public building. Okay. Alone in a public building or alone in a room in a, in a public building. Okay. Um, other thoughts from council? Uh, Jay and then Don. Sorry, just real quick, Jack. I had the exact same thought when I when I read that. Um, and what I don't want to do is get too in the weeds of how we're defining alone. You know, like it, it, you know, if we look at the science and say, like, what, what's an appropriate amount of space? Is it in a room? Is it in, uh, you know, um, it, it's hard to define a space because I could think about like what would be alone in the town clerk's office versus like the example Bill gave is like what's you know a uh, back room or upstairs room in a local business I think like having appropriate separation from the public makes sense so while it is somewhat vague I'm okay with the language as uh, as amended so that there's appropriate inter you know I think reasonable interpretation because I worry about getting you know too trying to define it all because it's really not it, it's inconsistent spaces that we're trying to define so anyways that's just my two cents okay. thank you yeah donna well my concern comes from hearing uh, the latest on vpr driving over to council meeting was that our masks are not going to be good enough for this current variance and that even with the double mask and one being surgical is chancy they're actually promoting a different kind of mask so if i'm alone in a room and my mask is off but you come in a little bit later I can put it on, but that's not gonna get rid of what's already in that room. So I, I can accept the language, but I think we may find we need further tweaking eventually. Any other thoughts? Uh, so is there a motion? If everyone is satisfied with the language the way it is and just uh, I I'm not going to make that make a motion to amend it. I I don't know how other people feel about the, uh, the, the, the yeah, I'm I'm happy with both <laughs> the the original amendment and and your addition to that amendment. I think it does make it clearer. Well, I move to amend it as I as I stated earlier. I think the clerk was probably taking it down. You got it, okay? Uh, no. I have pretty uh, simple though. I have assuming I'm legible here. Yeah, I, I, yeah, a I person who is alone in a public building or alone in a room in a public building is not required to wear a facial covering as long That's as it. they remain alone. Okay. I'll second. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed. Okay, and I do just want to recognize that um, we have Representative uh, Mary Hooper here with us um, and just want to uh, uh, come back to uh, talking about legislative stuff really quickly. If you want to, um, uh, Representative Hooper, if you, uh, we, we um, got to hear from folks as to what they thought the big issues were um, for this upcoming legislative session. And uh, would you like to, to add anything or, um, because I know you probably could see our legislative agenda and, and what what uh, we prioritize. We put the, the highest priorities at the end. Um, but if, if you would like to uh, add anything, uh, you are certainly welcome to. Well, thank you. And you're very kind to let me in at this moment. I, I, I deeply apologize for missing the earlier session. And I'll watch what what you all talked about. I I know what your agenda is and we are largely in agreement and i'm really looking forward to dealing with issues and really making progress around issues having to do with housing workforce development child care climate uh, you know I, the, these are huge and big and important and i think we have um some really interesting opportunities so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're in partnership on this, and I look forward to working with you all to help advance this. Great. Any other uh, questions or thoughts, particularly for Representative Hooper? Okay. Just say thanks for staying in touch with us. You always do. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I we, we really appreciate that. Yeah, and 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 I I'm gonna listen for a bit the you know the discussion about the mask mandate and certainly the homelessness issues around housing are are huge for our community and our state and I I, I look forward to really working with you all to to make progress. So thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Super. All right. Uh, so, so we voted on the mask mandate, right? <laughs> okay, just recapping. Um, go ahead, Jack. I think what we did so far is vote on my proposal to amend. Oh, okay. So, so I, not okay. Yeah, I move that we sure. amend the uh, policy uh, as uh, proposed by the manager as amended. Okay. Uh, motion and a second. Further discussion. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. All right. Okay, so now we are uh, up to uh, having a, a discussion um, about homelessness. And we, um, so um, we had asked the uh, homelessness task force to uh, come to the council with uh, sort of a report um, on sort of where we were at and what might be. Uh, the future look like where where are we going um, and also give us any uh, just relevant updates particularly uh, you know as uh, homelessness has been in the news recently um, and so I do see um, I Ken Russell here with us and so I'm going to turn things over to you. Thank you and good evening I'm glad to be here. Um, Rick DeAngelis was going to beam in from the transit center which was going to be a very exciting bit of 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 energy, but um, unfortunately there was no Wi-Fi. <laughs> so, but anyway, he sends his regards. Um, but um, as most of you know, we did open the transit center um, on Monday evening and, and boy, what a beautiful facility it, it is. Um, and what a lot of goodwill went into this project. Um, and there's just a lot of thanks to be given uh, gratitude for for this project. Um, Cameron Niedermeyer worked really hard to push, bring the ball forward. And so thank you for that, that great work. GMT was very responsive. Um, There's a lot of goodwill amongst uh, every staff member I've talked to there. It's very positive about it. They're like, it's really nice to have some life in the building. Um, definitely underscored the, the mission of, of taking care of folks. And so that's just really nice. And what we plan to do is take good care of it while we're there. Um, folks in the community have asked me about, well, you know, what if, you know, what if the people trash the place or this or that? Well, it's well staffed, um, although sometimes staffing is a challenge, but we have the bases covered seven days a week. And we're very pleased for it. We're bringing warming food and warming coffee, bringing it over every day. Um, and and the hope is that it's a, it'll be continue to be a gathering place. Um, a lot of the congregations have expressed interest in in being a presence there. Um, and there's a fantastic response from the community. Um, so uh, I want to th thank thank council for its support of, of that and other efforts. Thank um, staff. Thank the staff um, who are staffing these things from both Good Samaritan Haven and another way. Um, thank. Thanks to GMT and thanks to the community members uh, for, for both their support and those impatient to always have more get done. We're all in that boat. It's, it's a frustrating situation. Um, I know you all had discussed um, some of the deaths that had been reported on. Um, it's a population under siege. Um, it's a population that um, is, is really challenged and, and and a situation that's frustrating for, for a lot of folks. Um, so that, that's um, you know, one of the things we've accomplished. The other thing is the motel um, room um, and Rick DeAngelis just reported to me earlier, they've been using that program, been able to get some people out of the cold who would otherwise be there. And that's been fantastic. Um, the shelter program um, is continuing and it, you know, yet as the, the woman mentioned earlier, there are some challenges in there. Um, and I, I know that it's, 
it's the same sort of their challenges in, in all of this work. And so there's, there's so much humanity in all of this and so many people turning to, to try to make a difference. Um, the transportation money is, we're hoping that that can be leveraged with other money coming from the state that Good Sam is going after. I know Capstone, Capstone is also working with GMT to, um, and the, to both extend my, my ride and after hours service for GMT. Like a lot of these things, this, this, these things will take more time. We really do need a taxi service in this town. It's, I heard it's like $5,000 insurance policy to, 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 for livery work. Um, so let me just double check my notes here. Um, um, the peer outreach expansion, that's been just a continuation of really great work. Um, Don and Amelia are working really hard um, and are quite busy. Um, we have at another way, we have um, our own folks out there as well. Um, and there are a lot of really good hearted volunteers out there helping from human to human. Um, let's see. And then, okay, so the, the consultant money, um, there was $25,000 allocated and the $10,000 we did, we decided to, to align with a proposal that Will Everly had been pushing in continuum of care. And he's brought in some academics um, to study some of the root causes, causes of homelessness in the region to involve the homeless themselves in gathering information on what's happening. Um, second is one that it's ended up in, a, in the task force been a little bit of the bucket where all the unsolved problems come to, 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 to dwell. Um, and there's been a little bit of tension between, should we just build more, a couple more Girton parks? And I know that could cause some people to shudder. Um, and I, I can appreciate that. And I can appreciate there's been some angst around the conditions there. Um, from my perspective, it's, it's, it's just having that situation at the front of town helps remind us all that there's work to be done. Um, you know, I, I kind of threw out this idea, well, there might not be money for a recreation area there, but how about a social justice park or how about, you know, you know, Montpelier leading the way and tackling its hardest to problems right up front. But anyway, that, that's an idea. Um, but there, but there's, so there's some tension in around this, um, funding money between let's find something to do right now and let's versus let's do like a planning study. So we're, we're well positioned to spend greater amounts of money, such as the ARPA money you all have identified. Um, and, you know, it, and I think that that tension between slow versus fast is one we're, tr we're trying to optimize all the time. Like, how do we operationalize what, what we implement? And, you know, we have operational capacity issues with the organizations that are currently involved. It takes time to ramp up greater capacity. Um, so, um, but again, there are a lot of good people turning out, a lot of people questioning our approaches. It's like, try this, try this. Um, and we would really welcome the collective wisdom here and your your fantastic support of these efforts as well as acknowledgement of the gaps and of the underlying human suffering so that's that's my i'm you know that's it all right well i want to start with council any council thoughts or questions yeah go ahead connor well uh you know jennifer and i uh, serve on the homelessness task force uh, for the council and uh, did just really impressed with the group of people who come together there and, uh, you know, everybody like, you know, taking the time to really do right by folks who are struggling. And, you know, we heard some stories tonight. Um, I just came from the transit center and, uh, you know, hats off to Rick. Uh, he was staffing it himself. It's, you know, there's an executive director who, you know, really gets on the front lines. And uh, there were about six folks there who you wonder, like, if it wasn't open, where, where would they be otherwise? And uh, it, it's a tremendous service. And, you know, I definitely I understand what Ken is saying about the 
tension between trying to do as much as you can now because you know the, the problem is there uh, and, and people are hurting uh, versus the resources for the long term. It's like the right now solutions versus the right solutions. Um, and there's a lot of people putting their heads together. I, I met with uh, Peter Kelman and uh, Carolyn, who you see on screen uh, today there. Uh, so you do have different folks exploring different options. They were looking at uh, sort of a pallet structure uh, that may in the interim, you know, help to provide dignity and, you know, a shower with people, much like we were talking about with the trailer at one point. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. um, I, unfortunately, the trailer uh, didn't hold up to below zero temperature, so not, not, not a great fit in Vermont. But there might be some other options, and, you know, Peter and Carolyn um, have identified possible community partners on this, too. So it's something to take seriously. I think uh, we're meeting with Ken on that in the next couple of weeks to hopefully uh, see if there's something there. But I, I just want to, like, again, hands off to Ken, um, just one of the most selfless people I know here. And uh, it's, it's exhausting work, and uh, it, it's more than just a, a gig in another way. It's more than just a volunteer opportunity of real passion uh, comes in. So, um, you know, hats off to everybody. I think we'll be hearing maybe some more about some short-term solutions. Uh, you, know, you know, lockers definitely still a need, um, you know, laundry facilities, but hopefully uh, we can get a really tight consultant report together um, and come up with a solution that's gonna really help people for, for years and years to come um, as well. So just thanks for everybody doing this work. Uh, yeah, Jennifer, go ahead. Hi, yes, um, I agree with everything that both Connor and Ken have said. Um, I also think that it's really important to acknowledge the people that are on the ground, the social workers, the housing coordinators, all the people at Capstone, at Downstreet, at Circle, all the agencies that are working with our community members that are houseless right now. And we are tired um, because there are so few resources left and hotels are at capacity and staffing is at capacity and there's there's just not enough um for washington county for chittenden county i mean all of vermont you know it's it's this entire state we just need more infrastructure we need more people um and as a social worker it it hurts to know that you know my hands are tied that there is nowhere for me to send some of the families that i work with so um, I truly appreciate um, my colleagues out there that are, you know, feeling the same way I am, uh, especially around this time of year, delivering packages, um, toys to children in hotels is really not a fun thing to do. Um, but we put on a smile and try to make their day. Um, and so I want community members that are houseless that are here, I want you to know that there's a lot of people that are fighting for you and trying to do what they can with what they've got. And I am on this city council to try to make things move forward um, at a higher level than my job. So I appreciate your presence here tonight and I appreciate my colleagues and all the council and Madam Mayor for all the work that we're trying to get done. Thank you. Thank you. I also wanna just <laughs> agree. Um, I'm so grateful for, for this report, uh, Ken, and uh, please extend our gratitude to everybody involved, the Homelessness Task Force. Um, I have uh, particular thanks that I want to um, address uh, regarding the, um, the report that you all provided with us, but I'm going to hold off for a second because I want to check in uh, with the public uh, and see uh, if there are comments. We'll start with folks in person. Go ahead. <clears throat> Steve Whitaker again. Uh, trying, I think, is the opposite op operative word there. Uh, trying uh, two and a half years now, uh, and we still don't have lockers. We still don't have laundry. We still don't have unlocked phone charging. It it really is a travesty that folks can, you know, sit here and pat each other on the back and pretend like we're trying so hard. But I brought to your attention the problem for of carry where so we allow green mountain transit to violate their lease by not opening their bathrooms on the strict terms according to the lease now we're allowing another way we're giving money to another way so they can violate their agreement with christ church which is that 
all the residents at Christ Church get to use the warming space. She can't get to use the warming space because we negotiated the agreement and ignored it even after it was brought to your attention. So the did, did you everybody follow that? Did anybody not understand what I just said? No, nobody had it. So it was September. I got the as-built drawings. The city owns the transit center. I got the as-built drawings from Public Works. I said, here's a bathroom. There's a five-inch sewer line running directly under the bathroom that has enough space to put a shower in. This was brought to the Homelessness Task Force. This was brought to Public Works. Nobody did a damn thing about it. And now here we are, December, going into January, and people still don't have a place to shower. You know? And it's just a cluster screw of mismanagement that is just outrageous. You know, we're, we want to talk about pat ourselves on the back for peer outreach. We're still leaving people out in the cold. People are sleeping in frozen temperatures right here on 16 Main, you know? And we don't even bother to make public work sand the ice, so they have to walk up an ice grade, you know? It's just atrocious. It's really atrocious. Y'all should spend a couple nights out there yourself, you know? The, the consultant, they're talking about spending 25000 to talk about, you know, root causes of homelessness. We know that people get evicted, people get, you know, kicked out, marriages come apart, you know, et cetera. People have drug problems, whatever. That's not the issue. The issue is our callous disregard for two and a half years later, still leaving people out in the cold. Oh, let them eat planning studies. Let them eat thanks. Um, we noticed in, the, to, in this week's press that Burlington, uh, probably due to Dan being one of the more responsive and responsible people on this council, took the idea of the soft shelters. So it's going to take them five years to build interim housing, you know, or permanent housing for folks in Burlington, but they're going to implement soft shelters, you know, immediately. Soft shelters is the only way we can put people indoors who do not fit in. Uh, a horrendous situation you heard described earlier. I don't think it's safe during a pandemic to pack people in a room without adequate ventilation. You're setting yourself up for a, a real ugly situation. Uh, build more Girton Parks. That's an example of our task force leader. You know, as if Girton Park is a dignified shelter for people. You really, guys, y'all really need to uh, take it to heart, and I encourage you to spend a night out or two and, and realize that this is the most miserably pathetic effectiveness of any initiative that I've ever seen in the city. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, Jennifer. Mr. Whitaker, I would ask you to spend some time with me and get to know me and know my history. I have been homeless. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I think it would be important for you to know everybody's history before you accuse them of not understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, anyone else? Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, Carrie Kelly. Um, I would say I think it's a great idea, and I was hoping for a long time that it would be made into some type of warming shelter, but that will not be an option for me. Um, your police will continually drag me out, so I will eventually be victim number three of exposure. Um, so I will have nowhere to go. But I am not homeless because of drug addiction or anything that I did. Mine is domestic violence. I've been fleeing for my life for three years from someone. I have a refrain from abuse order that police uh, refuse to uphold. His uncle is uh, in law enforcement and manages to sort of speak to local law enforcement to get him out of issue. When I call for help, I tell them to go right, they go left. So he's not that elusive, he's nearby. Um, I've had my SSDI taken by him and everything else, so I am penniless. I can't go out and just pay to have somewhere to live, or I would. I am not able to use another way's resources to receive mail to get a birth certificate, or my S, uh, SS um, social security card so I can get a job and get housed working at a resort uh, because they refuse me services. 
which seems odd. Um, having worked briefly on the Barry task force uh, with Erica, who is employed there, who ghosted me after I got a very nice, sizable grant in October for phones, um, I feel upset that I lost three people that I may have personally had contact with at one point because they probably had no phone, you know, to call. The great thing about you know, QLIC is they did increase their data, but then they started charging for phones. So a lot of people didn't know. But I don't fault anybody for not knowing what it's like to be homeless. No one should be. Um, it's a difficult process. It'll be more of us. I'm part of Mosaic. Mosaic has a small facility. I would like to urge you to look into putting a domestic violence uh, shelter in uh, Montpelier, if you could. You do have several buildings. I mean, I, I'm not sure if the recreation center was ever bought. That's a possibility, and I think there's a couple other empty buildings, but any little bit helps us. There's a lot of other domestic violence survivors out there. Uh, we are fleeing, but we're not as uh, equipped as some to live on the streets and around others. We get taken advantage of, things happen. But I have a suggestion, actually, for the showers. Um, it's kind of simple and stupid. But if you guys were to put in just like $40, I mean, it's kind of silly. It might be a little messy. But if I brainstorm, I might be able to come up with something. Uh, camping showers are about $40. But they can be hooked to faucets and whatnot. Um, if we sort of put a tub or something, something large maybe, well, I'll, I'll think about it. But we could probably even hook that up at my shelter. Um, another way, of course, only has, I believe, one shower that I've used in the past when I was allowed entry. Um, even if the bus station would be so kind to, as to donate, well, not for me, but like a shower, um, one of the restrooms, male or female, whatever, it doesn't really matter, um, just so you have running water through it. That could work. Um, people do it camping all the time. It's not the greatest, but I'll tell you what, a shower is great, you know, wipes aren't the best. It's hard to wash your hair. Um, if you would consider a female shelter at this point due to the situation, I know there's lack of funds. Like, I know there was an issue with Bethany due to funding and services. But I think a lot could be taken care of in a few days just by getting that social worker. I think her name is Susan Lemire, and she works in between Barry and Montpelier. She'd be happy to sit with anyone. She found me on the street, you know, and helped me and got me out because police refused to assist me in any way, and I wasn't getting any help from another way. Um, there are other people like me that don't get services. I'm not the only one. Um, it's just, I'm not a bad person. I'm not a drug addict. I don't drink. I don't do anything. But I do speak my mind. I'm considered an activist, and I'm not going to stop. But uh, I'm very in favor of police reform, as your local law enforcement knows. And um, I also had a couple of small questions. Um, if it would be possible to get some of those services at the shelter, maybe slight assessments of needs. Um, you know, drug addiction is a mental illness, but maybe you can parlay some of that together. Um, you can seek housing through those groups. You could seek housing through treatment. If people aren't willing to for treatment, then you can go through a mental health because there will be psychological ramifications, brain damage, whatnot. Um, so that would be another option to sort of push us out into some other programs so it's not so cost costly, period. Um, my other thought was, let me see, the other was the planning for illness. I just wanted to know what the plan was. Um, my big issue at one point, I couldn't get any transportation to even get tested. Will there be rapid results? tests available at the shelter just in case we do need them to have them on premises so we don't have to travel on the buses or anything like that and when you're sick it's kind of hard um, and then afterwards would, would there be a respite because cdc recommends about 20 days of respite after being treated in a hospital or some type of quarantine area or if you have any facilities where people could like a bottom floor of a motel or something to keep the sick just so it doesn't spread at an alarming rate. Um, I heard of Elysium. I don't know where that is. I know it's a respite nearby. I don't know if that's a possibility. 
Um, and I think that's all I'd see. I saw several taxi companies, but I know in Burlington Green Cab had a cooperative with the hospitals to give people's rides home, which was an issue at CVMC and Barry for people getting home. So that might be something you could look into, how they structured it. They worked it somehow. Or you could couple it with Medicaid possibly. I don't know. Uh, Medicaid does a lot of rides. Um, Medicaid needs a little help as well, but that's not your job for that. <laughs> but other than that, those are just like my thoughts. I'm just, you know, concerned because if we don't have transport to do these things, people are going to spread. And that's, that's all I, I was sort of thinking of. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Just um, for Ms. Kelly and Mr. Whitaker and anybody else who might be paying attention uh, tonight, the city does have showers available at our recreation center. Um, they are available. Um, we can't advertise it because it's not ADA accessible, so it can't be considered a public place, but they are available for people to use if they wish, and they can contact Cameron if they have any questions. Those have been available really since summer. Um, so the city has made those showers available, and we certainly hope people will use them. Great. Thank you. Excuse me? Um, Sorry. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Um, any other comments from the public, particularly? Oh, yes, go ahead. Sure. Yes, yes. <clears throat> I, I didn't get too prepared on this tonight. Um, but before I speak, I just want to say that many times I can't hear what people are saying. I do have hearing difficulty, but also with the mask, I think everyone needs to really speak up more um, because it's such a difference when you don't have the mask and you can look at read lips kind of a little bit, you know, it helps out. So I, I'm hoping you can hear me. I and don't think they can hear you in the back. I don't think they can hear you. I don't think they can hear you in the back. Can you hear me now? Yeah, oh, that's better. see, I've yes. got it now. There you go. <laughs> so I, I just hope everyone also will be mindful of that because many times I can't hear many of the members on the council and I really want to hear them and I need a hearing aid, but you know, people are in different stages of that and it takes time to get one. So just the mass thing really makes a difference. Um, um, I just will be general general comments i am very much for bathrooms and lockers and i i wish that could be seen more as a real welcoming center for montpelier montpelier's state capital but we don't have i think it really needs to be like comprehensive for everyone you know to have a welcoming center that has nice bathrooms and lockers um I am for uh, the pallet initiative um, that's been talked about. I don't think, you know, building big housing units is great and everything, but not everyone can live in that style of housing. And I really think we need to go with, with the options of tiny homes and temporary shelters too for the kind of shelters that can be put up and taken down because we are in climate change. We will see natural disasters. I mean, can you imagine if Vermont was like Kentucky is right now? I mean, can you imagine? I mean, that's just horrific. So we really need to be more prepared on, on emergency shelter. And I think the pallet company covers both. Um, so the bathrooms, the pallets. Um, I thought this person that just spoke um, had some really great things to say and some good ideas. Um, I wasn't for the, the planning study completely, the part about um, paying people to say, why are people homeless? I think that's already been said a lot. You have a lot of committees throughout the state I would have rather seen that money go to uh, 
you could pay each person that's homeless and <laughs> divide up that ten thousand um, dollars I don't have too much else except uh, I think it's called the Girton Park structure I, I really will look forward to I hope getting better some signage there I don't know if there's any signage but I'm I'm very anti littering and I just think that that um, people need to be made more aware that there are the trash cans and the recycling right out front. Um, so that's great. And um, I know uh, Steve said it might be a, um, an, a bad idea to have more shelters like that. But actually, I, I think that'd be good to have a few of those. Um, because people need to gather, people need to be social. This, I see a lot of people hanging out there and not just, not just staying overnight there, but people need a place they can get under and, uh, you know, out of the weather and talk. And a lot of people can't afford to go in a store and buy something or a cafe. And we need that. we we need that even in the winter, some places people can have a roof over their head, you know, several small places or a few big places in different areas where people could uh, gather and, and talk, you know. And another thing I want to mention is frequently when homeless, uh, people talk about homelessness, they frequently mention drug addiction, um, you know, all, all kinds of things uh, like that. And a lot of times it's simply as I think a lot of people here know is, but I'm going to say it is the the expense of rentals is just insane. And I think really we're we should come down to looking at uh, some regulation on that at times. And many times people lose their housing for so many other reasons. And we need to be mindful that it's not just substance abuse or criminal history or something and um, take that into account because that is I lost my housing I don't drink I don't smoke I don't have pets um, it's a pretty uh, rough story that I won't go into but uh, the lease ended basically I made a um, I asked for a reasonable request on something and they ended my lease so well it was up for renewal and I'd already gotten the paperwork to renew. But then when I asked, I thought, well, if I'm going to live here, I'm going to ask for this reasonable request. And after they got my request, the next day they ended my lease. My They didn't renew. They said, we're not renewing. And, you know, I don't know if a lot of people know that you might have a lease and it can end, you know, it doesn't have to be renewed. There's, uh, I think it's called no cause. And so you're not always protected because you have a lease and you think it's going to renew. It doesn't always, and they don't have to have a reason. I think um, this situation with rentals uh, really needs to be addressed. Many people lose their housing for many other reasons. And uh, this has really gotten to be a really poor, uh, a really poor way to live you know, when we have so much that's, you know, possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Oh, Mary, would you just come up and say your name for us again, just for the, for the record? Pardon me? Oh, if you would say your name again. Oh, yes. Um, Mary Messier, now residing in Montpelier. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. All right, and I know we have uh, a couple folks uh, digitally who would like to say something. So we'll first go to Deborah Glotman. Go ahead. Hi there. Um, I uh, I run a, a program called the Mitzvah Fund. Um, we provide uh, veterinary, um, both dentistry and surgery, and um, multiple different things for homeless people, along with. Uh, veterans and low-income seniors. Um, I work closely with Bill, with Will Eberly, um, Don on the ta on the task force as well. Um, I just wanted the 
council members and um, the public to know that we exist. Uh, we will have a mobile unit, um, hopefully in the middle of February, um, and then we will be um, a lot more visible um, if we can find a place to park it <laughs> in Montpelier. Um, but I just wanted everybody to know that um, we have resources for uh, folks that have, uh, especially homeless folks that have animals that um, need uh, care. And uh, often people will stay outdoors versus give up their animals. So um, we, you know, we want to help everybody that we can. So I just want you guys to know that we're out there and we do currently um, help social services along with Montpelier Police Department when they arrest someone and there's a dog in the car, they call me and the dog comes and stays until a family member can uh, retrieve the animal. Um, so we're, we're on, uh, on the, um, we're not that visible yet, but uh, we, we are here and we want you guys to know about us. Great, thank you. Um, and if I could make one comment about that, just in terms of like finding a parking spot in Montpelier, I, I guess I would just encourage you to work together with the city staff uh, to, uh, to arrange that. And, um, and thank you for, for doing that, that good work. Yeah, uh, all right, uh, uh, Vicki Lane, go ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to come, I somehow my computer did things, so I didn't catch what um, Deborah Glotman was saying, but um, I just wanted to go back to what Mary was saying pertaining to the rents. Um, I cannot comprehend how anyone can afford to rent these days because I see the rents that are advertised and I would all, I would immediately be knocked out of, because I don't make that much money to even afford a rent. If I didn't have my house in so many, as many years as I do, I'd be out on the street because I just don't have that much monthly income to afford any kind of a rental. So I would encourage if there's any way to put some kind of uh, regulations or whatever on on runaway rental fees. It just seems ridiculous to pay the things I see people having to pay. I don't know how they can afford it. That's just my comment. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else with this digitally wish to make a comment? Yep, go ahead, Peter Kelman. Oh, we can't hear you. You are still muted. There you go. Okay. Sorry. Peter Kelman from Montpelier. Uh, Connor mentioned that uh, Carolyn Ridpath and I have been working on uh, ideas, very concrete ideas that the council might be able to um, act on more quickly. Uh, and I'd just like to share some of those thoughts with you today. Uh, this winter, there'll be somewhere between 40 and 60 chronically unhoused people living outside in Montpelier once again. And these unhoused people have no permanent shelter where they can safely leave their belongings when they need to leave their makeshift outdoor shelters to run errands, to go to appointments, to socialize with others to use a toilet and sink, to go to the laundromat, to hang out somewhere that is warm and dry. In short, to carry out all the activities that most of us can do in our own homes or by driving our own cars. These unhoused people deserve dignified, autonomous shelter that protects them and their personal belongings from the elements. They need and deserve to be able to privately take warm showers and use sanitary toilet facilities. And many of these unhoused individuals will continue to sleep outdoors in temporary shelters this winter because they don't qualify currently for existing state shelter programs or are not allowed in group shelters or for behavioral reasons or have emotional difficulty being housed 
in congregate settings like cold weather overflow shelters. Uh, our idea of something that could be done quickly uh, is to uh, establish a downtown hub uh, where, which has been previously uh, thought about doing uh, in the city parking lot behind St. Augustine's church. And this downtown hub would have three components, all of, uh, uh, um, all of which, well, are, can be gotten from the pallet company or other companies. One is a bathroom unit consisting of at least two private temperature controlled enclosures, each containing a toilet, a sink, and a shower, and that works um, in 20 degree below zero weather. A temperature controlled daytime community shelter space to be available for use by unhoused people, especially during inclement weather and periods of low and high temperatures it can work in the summer to, do, to get out of the uh, extreme heat. A mini split heat exchange unit for heating and cooling the community shelter space, and very importantly, sizable storage lockers to be maintained inside the community shelter space so unhoused people can securely store their personal belongings when they need to be out and about. Um, now, uh, just to point out what some of the strengths of this would be, the focus of this hub, although not limited to chron uh, chronically unhoused people, that is the main focus here, because these are the folks who are falling between the cracks of the various state programs addressing the plight of unhoused people in our community and region. So a community shelter space with bathrooms, uh, showers, private lockers are important to allow chronically unhoused people to have dignity, mobility, and safety. They would be able to move from showers to a warm space where they could also safely store their personal belongings in private lockers, and then be able to run the errands and go to other safe and warm daytime areas like the library, city hall, another way, and the transit center. By locating something like this in the city parking lot behind St. Augustine's, the unhoused uh, users would be near city services, including police, fire and ambulance, and the community justice center. They would be near grocery and other shopping, near the laundromat, the library, another way, uh, 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 Washington County Mental Health Services space on Barry Street, other downtown locations, as well as public transportation to get them to appointments in Barry and Berlin. And this hub could, uh, would be a well-maintained daytime destination downtown for unhoused folks who spend the night outside, thereby providing an alternative to sitting on cold sidewalks in front of stores or in the drafty Guertin Park structure currently located on Main Street between the drawing board and the multi-use path, which would please store owners, I believe, and permit the Guertin Park structure to be available for use by a wider range of community members as it was originally intended for. Now we've heard from many people that we've talked to the concerns about staffing, but we believe that this hub could be staffed during hours of operation by paid former and currently unhoused, unhoused people and community volunteers, all of whom could be trained and supervised by community service professionals like the politi city police social worker and outreach workers from another way, Good Sam and Washington County Mental Health Services. Some or all of these professionals could use the hub as a part of their base of operations, enabling them to check in on a regular basis. And if incidents that were beyond the skills of staff were to, the staffing were to occur, both the police and the EMTs would be close by and could be call, called. Um, I, I just wanna close by saying that these, uh, if, if you were to do, do, look into pallets, these are temporary structures so that when more permanent uh, arrangements can be made, such as uh, uh, having a hub um, at uh, the Twin City Motels, these can be taken down if it's decided that we don't want them downtown. Otherwise, you know, temporary, but they can last up to 10 years. Uh, we really, uh, uh, Carolyn, do you want to uh, chip in on, on this about empathy and empowerment? Um, Peter, if, uh, if Carolyn Ridpath would like to weigh in. I'm going to let her raise her hand. There's other people who would like to, who've had their hand raised. Um, okay, prior. then I'll just wrap up and say this, that winter is upon us. And once again, the living conditions of many chronically unhoused people in our community are appalling and morally unacceptable for a community like ours. 
where so many of us can take for granted the comforts and privileges that we enjoy that are, that are currently unavailable to numbers of our fellow citizens. And to continue to talk endlessly about this matter, to haggle over details, to cite real but solvable obstacles, to kick the can down the road once again is really unacceptable. The time to act on this is long past due and I would implore the city council to begin such actions as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. All right, uh, uh, Didi Brush, go ahead. Uh, but you are also still muted, so we cannot hear you yet. You still, there. okay, oh, there you go. There you go, sorry about that. It's okay. Um, I have a terrible cold, so I'm very husky. Excuse me. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that what I'm hearing from Peter makes such amazing sense. And I would like to endorse that plan and ask the city council to move as quickly as possible to offer this kind of um, resource to the, those in our community who need safe and warm housing. The other thing I'd like to say is that I too agree, I guess it's already happened, but to me to hire a consultant to tell us the roots of homelessness seems to have been perhaps an, um, a, a, an expense we did not need to incur. We, there are many, many, many studies about this. You probably already know what they are. We don't need to rehash that. We need to address those things that are at the root of that phenomenon for the people in Montpelier and Washington County. And that probably means housing, food security, jobs, and safety. And I very much would like to think that we are focused on that and not more studies, more reports, or more consultants. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Deborah Glotman, I'm gonna skip over you for now since you've already uh, spoken once. Um, so I'm gonna go to uh, uh, Carolyn, and I assume it's Carolyn Ridpath, is that correct? That's correct. <clears throat> okay, go ahead. Well, I wanna support what the first woman said and what Peter said that, uh, Living outside is undignified. I mean, it's dangerous. It's, it's, it's a terrible way to live. And anything we can do to dignify, allow those people to achieve dignity, I think is very important. And I think by doing the bathroom, uh, warming shelter, uh, locker arrangement gives them that chance that they can come in, shower, uh, put their stuff in a locker and basically prepare for the day. And as Peter pointed out, they can go out. Uh, the first woman who spoke talked about the uh, problems in even getting a shower. Now, if you go over to the rec center, they don't have towels. Just, it seems minor, but that's an important piece of taking a shower and because of people outside don't want to carry around a wet towel. So that, that's just one of the minor impediments there. Um, but at any rate, I think that um, providing that warmth, that support, uh, essentially enhances what's already available. I think that the council and the Homelessness Task Force have done an excellent job of fixing the pieces that we don't normally think about, like uh, providing meals or snacks for people who are in the overnight shelter or um, the uh, transit center is a major plus in that um, uh, constellation of support, the uh, outreach workers and so forth. So I think that uh, what we're suggesting takes it one step further um, and, and moves people toward a, a, a better way of living, even though it's still not good. Uh, I think that's all I've got to contribute at this point. Thank you. 
Um, and so just so you know, uh, Deborah, we usually don't let people go twice, uh, but if you have something short, that is okay. Uh, yeah, this do it doesn't have anything to do with um, what I spoke about earlier. Um, my question is, has there ever, and this is just for maybe others' education, has anyone ever thought about going to some of these um, landowners or you know, store owners or um, like, for example, um, the funeral home is empty. Um, they utilize, you know, where uh, the Jacobs make their money there is in the parking spaces. Um, would it benefit the city if, um, you know, they, the city takes over having to do any of the rehab that comes from the funeral home and potentially make that into a warming center or better yet, a, a shelter within our own capital city, which it just, it floors me that there is, we are the capital city and we don't have a, a good option, um, a permanent option for our homeless. That's just a question. And if anybody has that answer, that would be great. Thank you. Um... I'm not sure about the answer to that, but if someone does, we, oh, what's that? Oh, you said it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it is a good idea. All right, um, any other comments, either in person or digitally? If it's short. It's short. Uh, many of the problems you're hearing about tonight that are, are still recurring have to do with the council having only beginning now to get their head around this issue or commit to resolving it but we have offshored our uh, public accountability by giving grants to another way and good Sam, et cetera. We don't see the paper trail of who's falling through the cracks. It's not subject to public records law. So that's why I've insisted that if you want this stuff to work and to follow through and find out what's not working, you need to build some accountability transparency provisions into those uh, grants to nonprofits. Thank you. All right, um, if it's short, I probably should not have opened the door here, but go ahead. I just wanted to let you know I have been looking online at the CDC has a bunch of grants listed that may, um, groups may not be aware of. There's a lot. So you'd have to go through and see which one would work best for you. I don't know if they're all new or whatnot, but this was just as of like two days ago. And also I just wanted to thank the community themselves. Even the jacket I have on my back right now, because another way refused me resources. I had no gloves, no hat, no nothing, because I was just locked out of my room. I would have froze to death. So I wanted to thank the community. At the time, I had no money, no nothing, that they gave me that, and they kind of saved me from the exposure. But in the meantime, uh, I also wanted to suggest if it would be possible for the library to maybe open the basement or one of the rooms that they don't have um, in use all the time. I know it is considered free the first couple hours and then like $5 each additional, but for some reason they don't want to rent that to me, even if I have the money. Um, but being homeless is very tiring. So sometimes you just want to like kind of lounge out a little bit because it's like a constant thing. It's not that we're lazy. It's just like a constant struggle, like pushing my stuff, carrying my bags so that it's not like stolen and I'm, I don't have clothing to wear. That's just a thought. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right. Anyone else? Okay. All right. So coming back to council, um, just further thoughts. Um, I'm happy to jump in here too. Um, I want to come back to uh, the uh, the update memo that uh, the homelessness task force provided with us. And uh, so, Ken, I just want to um, point out, I'm, I was very interested in the proposed long-term solutions. Um, appreciated the, the variety of things that were there and the, um, the collaborations um, that, that embodied with the Washington County Continuum of, um, continuum of Care, uh, that uh, it seems like that is gonna be a really valuable partnership uh, moving forward. And uh, so, um, thank you for that. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, more, you know, particularly about, you know, both the, the short term and the long term uh, solutions. So, yeah, just wanted to pass that on. Thank you. Yeah.
Other thoughts? Uh, I'm going to go Donna, then Connor. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Ken, and thank you for the report, if there's any timelines. Um, you talked about just currently trying to finalize the questions. So I'm just interested in what kind of timelines <laughs> you're using. Yeah, well, soon on, on the grant, I mean, I think within, certainly within the next two meetings, we, we should have something. Hopefully, we'll meet January 5th. Um, or is it the 4th? Uh, the first day of the month. Um, and we'll definitely come back there. I mean, the the hub concept is something that's in there as well. Um, and we um, had been hoping to continue the conversation about how the pallet homes could work. Um, we had raised some questions, some logistical questions that I, I think would be really helpful in terms of putting together an actionable plan um, with with what, how, what, however we build something. Um, I just would like to say it would be, the siting is always an issue. And so one huge help the city could provide would be help with space. Um, you know, I know people are always talking about the rec building or, or the, 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 the park between Shaw's and the drawing board. People mentioned the funeral parlor. Um, we have had outreach to different landowners, um, but, you know, you know, bricks, the bricks and mortar part is often not the hard part. Um, um, I think proper staffing, uh, I think volunteers is great, but frankly, like um, for liability reasons, for a lot of other reasons, accountability reasons, you, you need somebody on payroll. Um, I mean, we, we just, you know, we had a cleaner who could show up to the transit center to clean up after the first and second night to make sure that that nice facility is well taken care of. Um, sorry, Donna, I just kind of- No, all good information, go ahead. Yeah, um, but, and again, it's it's brutal, it's brutal that it's winter right now and there are people outside. So right now, the immediate timeline is, is, oh, is an abyss and it's horrible for the folks who are out there. Uh, well, and I, I wasn't, trying to put you on the spot for all the activities, just I meant to focus and I wasn't clear on the study. Uh, yeah. The, the two components well, of the study, if there's actually a task plan and a sort of general timelines with them have yeah. been assigned. You know, I should know this about what Will has spearheaded. I know they're actively working on that. Um, I, I think if you don't have it, maybe you could obtain it and pass it on to us. Oh, you are oh, you muted. You are muted, Ken. Sorry, I, th I think I remember it. it's just a matter of months. Like it's like three to six, something like that. Um, and then, you know, I understand that the big pool of money you all have is like eight months out or something like that. So um, it would be helpful to have this, you know, have the planning study move quickly. Um, And hope, and hopefully, you know, within the next, I, I would say, the we'll talk about it on the fourth or the fifth, and ho hopefully have some real cohesion on that, and then try to get something to you by mid-January. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Connor. Well, I'll be a bit repetitive because I was hoping to chime in answering some of that, but uh, yeah, I think it's important. It was brought up uh, the study a couple times by folks in public comment. It's more to know just a portion of that goes to the continuum of care. I, I think like as we're looking at this, like it's an issue that doesn't recognize geography, kind of like you know PFAS. Um, we, we're really glad to see the Barry City Council um, appoint the homelessness task force as well. So we're, we're hoping to you know chip in and you know look at some of the demographic information countywide, uh, but just want to clarify the majority of the uh, funding in that would go towards you know answering some of the questions we had when we had the budget there. You know, what does it look like exactly? How much is it going to cost? Who could stamp it? Where is it going to be? Um, because r right now, you know, I think we agree it should be four walls probably. It should be warm. It should have a restroom facility. Uh, but there's a, a bunch of different ways you could take that. So hoping to nail that down soon. So like Ken said, when that ARPA money comes, we can hit the ground running and there's no delay on it. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, one of my biggest questions I thought was going to be answered was very practical. Is it a big space that we take and renovate to put lots of people in one place? 
or do we do something like the pallets and make a temporary uh, transitional, not necessarily temporary, but a transitional place? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's what I'm really looking for. What's our best way to meet these people's needs that we know of? Yeah. We've got to iron that out really soon. Yeah. yeah. Other thoughts, questions, comments? Yeah, Lauren, go ahead. Um, one, I don't know if this is a, a, a question, just having our uh, wonderful representative Mary Hooper here, not to put her on the spot, but I'm just curious, like listening to this and maybe it's just planting some seeds for you, but um, you know, what opportunities, you know, we started off with your colleagues, Connor was kind of framing up the issues that we're wrestling with and how, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of work, we're trying to make progress. Obviously this is a big statewide issue and with budget implications well beyond what a city can do. So I don't know um, either from you know programs or things that you're hearing, um, you know the peer support outreach workers. Like, are there are there opportunities for the state to help invest in some of these initiatives so that we could do more sooner and support more people in our community? And I don't, I don't know if you have any any thoughts. I I hate to put you on the spot, but you know hopefully it could just be an ongoing conversation too of how how we partner in this work because obviously you know we we are partnering and we're trying some. I think, you know, interesting things and would love to expand it. And if there way, there's ways to, um, you know, just be in good touch with you about how the state might help support that um, as well. I would love that. So if I may, thank you. And this is something that I've thought about. Um, I, I, this is absolutely a statewide issue. And to be perfectly honest, I am concerned that the solutions are being offloaded to communities rather than being addressed from a statewide stand, standpoint. Um, and so I'm always going to be pressing uh, the Department of Children and Families and the Department of Mental Health and Dale to be fully funding their programs, which are providing these services and building the opportunities. And I, I, I think the partnership with communities is appropriate, but I don't think it's appropriate for um, communities to be forced into taking the lead on this when it truly is a statewide issue. And I'm, I'm worried that we not see kind of a continual kind of offloading of responsibility for this. Um, uh, Mary, yeah, if, good. I, yeah, yeah, if I could ask you a question about that, who does our legislative delegation go to within the state house to try to get that change mm -hmm. to help encourage the state mm -hmm. to take that on and take that responsibility and be the leader Mm -hmm. in the housing issue and services around people that are unhoused. Yeah. So there are uh, uh, two committees in the House that have primary responsibility for this. The first is called House General and Military Affairs. And uh, I think it has housing in their title too. And they, they are carefully and deeply looking at and have been the architect of a lot of the housing proposals. So it's, it's House General that's responsible for the housing side. And in terms of the um, service side, it's, um, it's, it's House uh, Human Services that is responsible for that. It's, it, although healthcare comes into it, and then, frankly, it all comes together in in my committee, the House Appropriations Committee, because you know it, we have to figure out what the right programs are. At, but at the end of the day, this is just it, it's a matter of money and and workforce. As you all know, um, the the community based partners who are trying to provide these services are just overwhelmed with demand and really struggling to bring in um, the resources, you know, the human, yeah, you know, finding people to do really hard work. So you, but, so I answered your question in terms of who should be doing this, but 
but frankly, I would also be asking um, the executive branch what they're going to be doing for this. So in the budget adjustment, which my committee has already received, we did not see um, a substantial response to the ongoing problem. And I, I had been hoping that we would. We may get something the first week of January. I know they're bringing us more, but um, I, so ask the executive too, ask the governor's office too, how they're gonna partner and, and, and make sure that the resources are where they need to be. I think Connor has a follow-up, unless he... Uh, just the follow-up of that, I, I think municipals depend maybe too much on the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, mm -hmm. and, and I feel like we should really start a serious campaign that, yes, the Vermont League can lead the way, but that we need to muster municipals and their residents to really make it clear to our legislators and our executive branch this is huge. It's got to be done this time. Mm -hmm. Connor, go ahead. Mary, I want to thank you. You've, you've been so great offering to go to any meetings with the administration uh, or other legislative committees that have jurisdiction over this. Um, the one thing we were hitting with the uh, senators just earlier there was we, we have met with BGS and we feel like we have a fundamental disagreement with them in, in terms of the uh, public restrooms there. We, we feel there's such a need in town because uh, th this could be providing services uh, for washing facilities, showers, um, and, and, and other services that give people really the dignity that they need ar around the clock here. <laughs> it, it's sort of a bricks and mortar expense, and it's something we'd love to be able to share that responsibility uh, with the state there. So yeah. to the extent we could maybe get a conversation going in the Capitol bill um, uh, around some of, the, uh, some of the expenses with that, that, that would be yeah. fantastic. Th thank um, you, Connor. I know that you had raised that earlier, and I and so I appreciate that follow up. And and let's talk more about that conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. I think Bill has something to. Yeah, Mary. Say. Just to follow up on your comment about the state's role and municipalities' role, mm -hmm. and what we're seeing, and and I know you and I have talked about this, is this is falling to the local mm -hmm. governments because yeah. the resources aren't there. You heard Council Member. Morton referred to that earlier with her social worker hat on, and there's just no place else to go. So people in our community come here saying, what are you gonna do because nobody else is doing it? And I, I take that one step further, it really falls disproportionately, again, on those communities with sort of established downtowns and services. Mm -hmm. It's not every town and city, uh, and I think that, that may create some problem in, in your legislature because many of your fellow reps aren't dealing with this or their communities aren't dealing with this, but like lots of downtown issues that we've talked, you and I have talked about forever. Uh, this is one where, you know, the Burlington's, the Montpelier's, the Berries, the Brattleboro's, you know, the places with buses, the places with services, the places with healthcare um, are the places that people are coming for those services and, and are demanding it. And it falls disproportionately on our residents, taxpayers, businesses, and um, the state really does need to to step up and fund some of these things, you know, as you, I think you've seen a lot of willingness from people, uh, volunteers, professionals, and, and elected officials to do our part. But right now, we're we're in a world that we're not, you know, that's all new to us, and we we don't have the expertise, and we're trying to find our way. And so we would look to the state to really um, rebalance the scales. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I understand that, as you said, Bill, that you know, we have had this ongoing conversation and um, sadly it, it, it seems to me, and I've, I've watched this over the past four years in the Appropriations Committee, the state is trying to shed costs and the way they're shedding it is by pushing them down on, on the municipalities. And um, you're right, and this is the reason the league isn't as large of a voice is because they're representing all of the towns and it's not, you know, this is not an issue for Sutton or Derby at the way it is in the built up areas. I get it and, and we need to keep working on it. I, and and uh, let me just add, and, you know, and there's kind of a view that there is a ton of money floating around that can be used to solve these problems. I mean, we've heard of really 
rather phenomenal revenue forecasts and, and, and we're in deep competition over a lot of issues. A lot of people are looking for funding for a variety of, of issues. Yeah. So please keep advocating folks. Well, thank you. And anyone else else they want to share? Okay, thank you. And thank you for, for sticking around through this issue, um, Representative Hooper, that's, that's excellent. Um, and I also am encouraged to hear, uh, Ken, that we uh, may be hearing again from you soon um, with some updates and, and suggestions. So we look forward to that. Um, any other uh, thoughts, your team? Okay, thank you, um, everybody. And we'll, um, you know, it's certainly still on our, our radar. Let's uh, um, hope that we can come up with some um, actionable things soon. All right, thank you. All right, so we're uh, actually, it is 8.40. <laughs> Um, and so we're going to take a 10 minute break. It's 841. So we'll be back at uh, 851 uh, to jump in with uh, talking about the uh, ballot procedure. Um, when, when we return uh, ballot procedure. And so for this, I'm turning it over to John Odom, our city clerk. Go ahead. Well, I'll be quick. There isn't a lot to report the uh, just the, the Roxbury select board, you know, decided to not decide. Um, they know that there's a, um, uh, they, they pushed it to their January 10th meeting because they know there's a big bill, the first bill the legislature is going to work on is this election thing and they want to, you know, they want to know what's going to happen. Um, you know, I, I don't want to give any opinions on what anybody should or shouldn't do. Um, so we'll just have to see how it goes. It certainly cuts things close for me, which is unfortunate. But it is what it is, and um, I would say for what the implication of that is for you all is potentially nothing deciding on what you want to do. I mean, if you want to go ahead and authorize a, uh, you know, a mail-in election for the city regardless, um, you know, that would create four elections, four ballots, one of them gets mailed out, and we would certainly put a bright colored piece of paper in there saying if you need an absentee vote from any of these others, contact us. It would create a tremendous, potentially a, a huge amount of absentee requests for us that would be very difficult to manage, but Crystal and I did some brainstorming today, so whatever you all decide, we'll make it work. Okay. Um, but so, yeah, so I mean, if you all want to do that if you all want to go ahead and authorize the uh school given their ble your blessing i don't see why you shouldn't at this point um no point in holding off but um so either or i have some recommended um language for motions that pull some phrases out of the statute so and they're in our uh, the two phrases uh on the uh the, the two things that are in the recommended action of the cover sheet? Uh, no, I didn't phrase them that way. I can, oh, okay. I've, I've been sitting here <laughs> phrasing things Excuse as Excuse me, John, we... you've got to force feed us. You've got to give us the language. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll just, I can read them real briefly. The first one, if you all decide to give the school their, your blessing, um, I would use language pursuant to 17 VSA section 2680. Montpelier City Council grants its approval for the Montpelier Roxbury School District to mail its annual meeting ballot to all active registered voters in the district. And I added on, should the school board so choose and should the Roxbury Select Board grant its approval? Just so. I'll make that motion. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the alternative one was. And what? then the other one would be for you all, <laughs> pursuant to 17 VSA section 2680, authorize the city clerk to mail an annual city meeting ballot to all active registered voters in the city. So that would be for the city election if you chose to do that. The other one would be for authorizing, giving the school your blessing should they choose to. So we could do both. So we need two. So we could do is that, is, like both motion, they're not mutually exclusive. No, I I suggest breaking them up into two. Oh, you mean two separate motions? Two separate motions, Oh, yeah. okay, but, okay. But doing both of them potentially. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, Donna, did you want to make that? I did that so them... quick because I didn't want to have to try to reword it. <laughs> but my intention would be that we would be authorizing 
the Monte or Roxbury School District to conduct a mail-in election and to send all the ballot to send ballots to all the active voters. Is that you want? That's my motion with the with the lovely language you had. Oh, okay. So that's you have moved that. Okay. okay. Is there a second? Okay, there's a second over there. Discussion about this particular one. Um, Jay and then Jack. Or Jack and then Jay. No, go ahead. Sure. <laughs> I don't think it matters. So I just wanted to sort of come back to the earlier um, presentation. John, I'm, <clears throat> John, I'm disappointed. I, I don't see any unicorns. I'm just I, saying. No. Um, I, I, but but the uh, <laughs> of more consequence is. Um, there, there's a lot of variables here, right? So if, if the school district could decide not to do it, um, we, Rocks, you know, Roxbury may decide not to do it and, and be able to, to um, so they may decide not to mail it out. And it, it, from your previous presentation, there's other scenarios where there may be some in-person ballots, right? Um, the way it's, it's two possible ways, really, it's going to shake out. Okay. There are, think, think of it as there are four elections in play. Right. Um, city school, CVPSA, and the Career Center. Right. That's right. Um, all four of those, if you all mail, had to do a mail-in election, then anybody else who does a mail-in election can piggyback. And that's covered. And the great thing for me, in that sense, is if the school piggybacks with us, the school has to pay for it. So that's nice. I like that. But because uh, um, the thing, they're going to end up having to pay for all this themselves one way or the other when it gets down to it. So scenario one, there is a city ballot with a school ballot. And both of those ballots are still available at the polling place. But at the polling place, it's going to be the only place you can find CVPSA or Career Center unless you specifically call and ask for an absentee ballot of one or both to be sent to you. So then the other scenario would be that it's just the city. And then those other three ballots, including the city's ballot, are available at the polling place. Again, should somebody choose you know, to call and have one or all of them sent to them as an absentee ballot. So we're gonna have to be tracking these as four different elections, and tracking absentee requests as, as four separate elections, or three, depending on how it goes. Um, Going to be a little odd, but um, the biggest the, the the biggest potential challenge for my office is going to be if the school does not get on there because I suspect CVPSA Career Center a lot of people aren't going to be too concerned about asking for those ballots. I, I mean I don't I'm not trying to you know qualify the you know, make any, cast any aspersions on the quality of those ballots. I just think they won't. But a lot of people are going to say, see that note and say, I don't have the school ballot. I want the school ballot. And so we'll get a lot of requests for absentee ballots more than we otherwise would have gotten. Um, so that's, that's the crush I'm worried about, although that's the crush I think we've already found some workarounds to be able to manage just the two of us, because it's just the two of us, unfortunately, who do the elections. And, and so... I, I bring that up because my concern is that, you know, if we commit, my concern is that we, if if one of the, the scenario plays out where we we're mailing our ballot and others, requ you know, require a request or coming to, um, the to, to coming, to the building to vote, that we're sort of undermining that turnout and. Um, I th feel like the, you know a lot of folks will ap approach a lot of these things, some particularly some of the smaller issues, passively, and will just assume that they what they got in the mail is what they need to decide, or what you know. I know if they come, then they'll get them all, which is like you said, which mm -hmm. is great. But I just worry that where um, it's disenfranchising folks who may not be understanding the decisions that they need to make. I mean, and we'll, I know there's a ton of variables in yeah. how it all plays out. I mean, we'll make it as plain as we too, can. But, but, yeah. yeah. On, yeah. on the other hand, I know we're also going to get, there'll be pushback from folks concerned about COVID if this, if the mail-in thing doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I mean, you all know I'm in favor of it ideologically. I think in this case, I'm kind of, agnostic about the implementation um, 
I mean, it is going to happen for the August primary and the November general. So it may become an issue where people start to really have that expectation and they get confused when they don't get a ballot in the mail. But I don't know that we're there yet. So. Yeah. Uh, Jack. I'm like you. I think that uh, what we should be doing to make the uh, make it easier for everybody to vote. We should do anything we can to make it easier for people to vote and to get the maximum voter turnout possible. Um, but what makes me concerned is that uh, doing some kind of hybrid is going to make things much more confusing for people. And, uh, and I think that's a, a bad thing. And so I'm not really sure what I think we should do. Um, I, I think you said last time that you don't expect uh, the Barry City Council to authorize mail-in voting for the uh, for the two entities for which they're uh, a player, right? Yeah, that's correct, and it's that's been made pretty clear. And Roxbury. I imagine what they're waiting for is see if the state's going to pay for it, right? And if the state's going to pay for it, they'll say fine. Mm -hmm. And who knows otherwise? Mm -hmm. Would it uh, would it make a difference in your planning for the work if we decided, well, let's do what Roxbury's doing and wait to see what the legislature does? Um, or, or should you or should you have guidance from us right right now to make it? make it better let's see they're meeting on the 10th y'all are meeting on the 12th oh man that's less than two weeks before the filing deadline i mean i can make that work without sweating too much i don't have a lot of margin for error but i have a little so if you all wanted to wait for that decision then that's uh yeah that's cool um i don't know if you'd want to go ahead and grant the school your blessing or just wait. I don't know if it's uh, go ahead, Don. Well, That was my point. This motion doesn't mm -hmm. do away with ch them not doing it. This is this first motion is just dealing with the school district votes. It's the next vote, the general vote for the city. That's the one that affects Central Vermont Public Safety Authority and the other ones. I thought you phrased yours all as one motion for both no. the, uh, no? No, there's two motions. Yeah. I have one motion. They should the really happen separately. Oh, I agree, yeah. but I thought I thought you had written it, phrased it as one for both the school and the city. Okay. And, and my other question yeah. to John, procedure-wise, if we make any of these motions and the legislatures lay out a different format in their first week in January, then it's a it's no longer in, in effect if they decide to say this is how you're going to do your election at town meeting then that overrules anything we decide here um yeah i mean it, it at worst it becomes redundant because what a lot of folks would like to do is just do the same thing they did last year again now the question it would be does the secretary of state have enough covid money left to do it uh, I've heard conflicting things about that. Honestly, I suspect they probably do. Um, so that that becomes a question. They're either going to tell us to do it or they're not, and they're either going to pay for it or they're not. But I think in any case, if we approve it, the worst that happens is that the approval is, becomes a redundancy. Okay. So thinking about um, even just the schools, um, and thinking about your argument, Jack, of you know, does it create confusion? If the schools send one out, do you feel like that still is sufficient confusion, like the potential for confusion? Or, um, well, probably, yeah, I don't know. Probably not, because I think the schools and the city are what is important to people. And I think that the other two elections don't get a lot of public attention and people are likely not to even think about it. Okay. Fair enough. So any further discussion on this particular, about the schools? 
mailing out ballots. Yes, go ahead, Lauren. Yeah, I mean, just to me, the motion focus on the schools. I mean, if they want to do it, I think us signaling to Roxbury that we're going to give that approval now instead of waiting makes sense to me so that they know that we think this is a good idea and that, you know, our, in our, I mean, for me, speaking for me, my ideal is that we are doing it proactively for as many of the, um, as many of the elections as we can. I mean, just seeing what's coming with this new variant, I mean, it's going to be even worse than last year, potentially. So like, I think we should be getting ready for that. Um, so I think that to me seems like worthwhile. I'd still, yeah, I guess like if there's flexibility to see what they do and then decide how the city would want to, because I, I would feel differently. I think if the school is going to be in person, um, then I think keeping it all together might make sense. So I, I think maybe we want to have that conversation later. Um, but I think moving forward to the schools now makes sense. My uh, gut tells me that there's a 50-50 chance that they will not have passed their legislation by the by the 12th. Hmm. Um, having said that, probably at that point, if they haven't passed it yet, we're going to know what it looks like. So. Hmm. Okay. Any further comments about this particular item? Okay. There's been a motion and a second. Um, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. So. Um, sounds like folks maybe want to hold off on the, the second part. Is that sort of what I'm hearing? Unless somebody wants to make a motion. I mean, I'm, I'm open to that too. Okay. Uh, so we'll revisit that one. Hopefully that's at least partially helpful. <laughs> oh, no, it's great. I totally. <laughs> we have some clarity. I totally w get what you're doing and why. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, no Donna, complaints. yeah, go ahead. Well, you know, John, sometimes the mayor has us do this straw vote. Would you like to know what our straw vote would be about mailing the city's Oh, well, I'm certainly curious in the Okay, so sure. I would put a thumbs up. I think it's important the voters get it. Sure. I mean, do folks feel like they have a sense of what their straw vote would be? Yeah. Okay. We we don't, undecided. That's okay. Or undecided. No. I th I think the city and the schools should do the same thing. And ideally, it should be mail. But if the schools aren't aren't doing mail, then maybe we shouldn't either. Okay. Um. Saw a thumbs up from Connor. I, any thoughts on that, Jay? I, I, same. Same. Okay. Yeah. Thoughts from you, Jennifer? Same, same. Okay, yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, and Lauren agrees. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, well, so, well now, now you know. <laughs> so, to be continued on that one. Um, yes, go ahead. I, I wanted, Steve Whitaker again, I want to comment on the impact of this election on the Public Safety Authority. The which the thing you don't have time to dive into tonight or it's not on the agenda yet is going to get closer and closer to the ballot deadline and a number of folks one of the cvpsa board members just quit in disgust others are about to quit in disgust folks feel like the chair is trying to run it into the ground the initiatives by the city managers uh, are without having the benefit of the approval of this council I think it's going to, I guess how this relates to the election, this council is going to have to make a very clear statement to the public about whether you're going to squander and flush their investments in a regional public safety authority uh, in this election. Because if this election gets meager turnout or even attention or even people fold spindle or mutilate their separate ballot for CVPSA, it's good. They're going to have you. You will have squandered all the work, years and years of work. I'm reading the minutes from ten years ago, uh, efforts to get this thing created, and since fourteen, it was created. And I know, Mayor Watson, you were at, very active in in trying to see this succeed in 2017 and 18. So, I just suggest that if you're going to have a unusual ballot arrangement that the city make a very clear statement of informing the public about what's at stake here. Because just to let chiefs uh, run, run their own way and uh, 
continue the oh, continue the Montpelier monopoly on dispatch with a straw man partner of public mutual aid system. Mutual aid system totally ignores public records requests and appeals. And Dan was not going to allow the city, this city to re-enter that contract. As soon as Dan was gone, your city manager put it on the consent agenda to approve that contract. So we're in bed with us, or we're in a contract with a straw man entity who now is being tried to serve up the whole ownership of a new radio system. No transparent governance, no planning, nothing. Just hand it to the vendors and pretend like uh, it's good for the people. So I'm asking you to do your homework, put it on the agenda, have a meeting, and make sure the public is well educated on this topic before you squander all their investments made so far. Thank you. Um, I just want you to know, too, that uh, the city manager has my full support. All right, having said that, um, we're going to move on. Uh, all right, so um, we are, I think that's that's it for this item, right? Okay, so um, we are on to the budget review for FY23. Um, Kelly, do you want to say anything? I, I see you're like eager to come up. <laughs> if you want to, you may. <laughs> Um, but uh, I don't, well, I, I don't think know. Our, yes, go ahead. There were a few questions and things left over from last week, so I think Kelly was just going to oh yeah provide great. the responses to those and then leave it to you folks to great go forward. So. Friendly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm happy to provide um, just the updated budget option worksheet if you want to go through that again um, and just kind of take notes accordingly, but I also wanted to just speak to a couple of items that we talked about last time um, that we looked into for you or we have some response for. So I'll just kind of go down the list. Um, they're in no particular order. Um, so just in their large and small. So um, bear with me. Um, so the first thing on the list is I just wanted to note on page 12 of the budget book online, we've updated the um, housing task force to be the housing trust fund. Just wanted to note that we did that. Um, and if you'd like a new printed version of your book, because the print we've been hearing it all the way around is pretty small, I can do that. Just let me know. Um, then the next thing is we added a thousand dollars in um, for the USS Montpelier. It was not our intent to leave that out, um, so that was duly noted, and we've added it in. That's a net neutral change. Um, the next thing on my list is the charging station. Um, we just wanted to clarify intent with that. Um, our understanding based on the conversation was that we would look for grant funding and if possible would fund the charging station. Um, we did not identify how that would happen as of yet and so it's sort of still sort of an open item. Um, but I wanted to kind of highlight that so that we can talk it through a little bit more and you can let us know what you'd like to do with that. Um, the next piece is we added the $30,000 for downstreet um, recovery residents in Barrie um, to the ARPA 2 list um, per your recommendation and just took a little bit of money away from the infrastructure um, portion of that for the water sewer. Um, we also looked into the $15,000 for lobbying efforts in FY22. Because um, revenues have performed better than we had anticipated, there is some money there that we could harvest off to the side to be able to cover that this year. So if you want us to do that, we can in 22, and then it's on your list of options for 23. And so we would just need to make sure that that remains, should that be what you'd like to do. Um, so that's good to go. Um, the next um, couple of items are related to the capital projects on the bond list. There were a few questions related to the um, street conversion, the lighting, and also Barry and Main. Um, the question related to the streetlight conversion, it's $250,000 um, and when the payback would be on that. So we looked at the analysis that was previously done in 16 and if we move forward, we'll vet this even further just to make sure that the numbers are good. I think they might actually be even more favorable at this point. But that being said, right now, based on the initial projection, there would be a 10.9 year payback. Um, and that would include an efficiency Vermont incentive. So um, should we move forward, we'll get those numbers into focus and just make sure that we report that back out once we have it. Um, and then the other item in question for um, sort of the capital projects was the Berry and Main 
um, intersection project, just sort of noting what that entails. Um, so it's $550,000 and it includes three kind of parts um, in the explanation that we got from Public Works. Um, the first part is it's for the new traffic signal at the intersection, upgrades the software um, for the existing traffic signals at Main State and Main in Berlin. Um, and then the third piece, which I think is important to note, is that um, they would be more responsive and coordinating with one another for traffic flow and congestion. Um, so just wanted to highlight all of those items for that particular project. Um, and that's the end of my list. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we um, have been kind of working on for you. And I'll um, pull up the budget options worksheet. And then I didn't know if you had other Thanks. questions. Um, for us or you know how you wanted to get started and am i loud enough here sometimes i'm a loud fast talker which is maybe not a good combination <laughs> um, be a little closer could i add a little bit to the main yes. when she's doing that uh, the, the main and state barry and main street uh, traffic lights are more wonderful than we alluded to they're not just an upgrade <laughs> but they put them in sync with the other lights so if one light gets all jammed up, it reflects it in other places. So instead of being independent, it's really very responsive to traffic needs. And I'm looking forward to hoping it really works as it's proposed to work. <laughs> It'd be a good addition. Yeah, I agree. All right. Um, so in terms of um conversations anything um that we want to talk about on the list that um kelly just mentioned um i well i i would like to talk about uh the uh charging station um my understanding had not been that it was grant dependent uh, but that we would build it in and then should a grant be available that they would replace it at least that was my understanding uh i open to hearing other thoughts. Yeah, that's your understanding as well, Donna. Okay. Yeah. And Lauren shaking her head. Any other thoughts on this? Okay. Um, and and I, I guess I would say just in part, I would rather be able to say with some certainty that we're going to move forward with that. Seek grants, probably there are some <laughs> available for this. Um, but, uh, you know, should we either not find one or not get one? Um, that we hopefully would still be able to to move forward. Thank you for that clarification. I guess my question then would be, w which funding source did you? Were, were we? I think one of maybe we were going to see if it was ARPA eligible. Maybe that's what was our homework. Yeah, I, I, I do. I do not think I it is know. ARPA eligible. Right. Just based on the eligibilities, um, we do plan to. Um, review our ARPA list with the VLCT and take advantage of those resources and so we'll certainly ask um, but that I, I don't just based on what the guidance is so right that now would come from so then our choices would be either add it to the budget and raise the budget put it in the capital plan and replace something something else or put it in that the capital reserve money and replace something else thoughts Go ahead. Yes. What can we replace? <laughs> yeah. If that's what you want, we can come back with a proposal. I, we misunderstood that. So, um, so any other um, thoughts or opinions about um, where that should come from? I guess I would also just say, um, see if there is if something that could be. Um, replaced potentially. I mean, there is. Uh, uh, I guess my if I if I had to choose. <laughs> I mean, I trust you all, but um, if I had to choose, my gut would be um, somewhere in the, the capital improvements um, uh, plan. Which, to be fair, I mean, the, the real, <laughs> like how much wiggle room is there in that? You know, not necessarily any more than anywhere else, but um, just because it, that seems like. Um, where it would logically fit. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, no, to be fair, uh, yeah, um, we can see how it, 
um, how the rest of this this is budget shakes out. Put up for this? That's in that plan, or is that too cumbersome? Um, <clears throat> just trying to think about the best way to show what's in that plan. Yeah, that's fine. We we can. Um, I'd agree that that's the smarter approach as opposed to adding it on and yeah. then hoping that we could make it back up with grant funding. So right. I, I do think that that's the right way. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I oh. can certainly pull up the list. Let's see. Okay. So why don't we have them continue conversation and we can come back to that. Okay. 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 Um, Lauren had a thought. Go ahead. Yeah, no, just, just briefly. I mean, I think it seemed like the vehicle purchase was really tied to like being able to move forward with trying out some of these electric vehicles like we need that charging capacity I, I know I had brought up grant funding um, with the federal infrastructure bill I know that there's a good amount of money coming but like that guidance isn't even out yet you know that who knows when that money will actually be available how it will flow and certainly it doesn't seem clear yet how a community like ours will necessarily take advantage I think there's good opportunity but I would not want to like wait for that um, to, because then it seems like it's holding up then all the progress on the fleet. Well, so. have a couple of I have a couple thoughts. <laughs> okay. So okay. Okay. Thoughts. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, anything else? Um, particularly? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Donna. No, no. no. I was no. gonna say anything else particularly from the list that um, Kelly just went through. Um, there was nothing else on my radar of things that you said that you know, felt like they needed to be further addressed, at least from my perspective. Um, other uh, further thoughts and comments generally? Uh, yes, Connor, go ahead. You know I left 15K uh, somewhere around City Hall here, so just want to <laughs> <laughs> really, really appreciate everybody looking really closely and see where we could find that for this year. Thank you very much. And thanks, Bill, for bringing that up last time. It wouldn't have helped us too much in July. Uh, yes, Donna, go ahead. Uh, actually, you added the 14,100 for the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority twice. So the spreadsheet, the way that it calculates, the upper portions don't actually get into the tax rate unless that they're captured in this bottom section. Okay, so you need to repeat that one. Yes. Okay. And I wanted to call it out above oh. just so that then there was the comparison and side by side. Um, so yes. Okay. Unfortunately, it's a um, a work on the sheet, but I just didn't. Well, link when you the said formula. it was a formula problem, I thought maybe the line wasn't included above. So yeah, I, no, I, I no. hear what you're saying. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, one one. I'm sorry. To, I didn't, Mean to interrupt. Um, one thing that I think might have been confusing for folks um, is the difference between these two numbers. Um, can you? Would you mind just explaining, like, why? Sure. Why does it say both six point eight and nine point seven? Sure. Yeah. So the nine point seven is a total bottom line number, and so that's with all um, sources. That's all costs. That that is the bottom line. However, if you look at it from a property tax perspective. They're two different figures, and so when you think about what will impact voters um, and their pocketbooks, it's really this 6.8% number so that's based on their property taxes and what we would need to levy. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, other comments about the current version of the budget? Uh, yeah, Jay, go ahead. I just wanted to add one thought, you know, looking looking at the other additions piece, and I know um, curious where Jack's thinking is because because we were kind of of the same mind last time. Um, and like I said, I, I fully support the the concept of a, an energy coordinator. Um, but see, as, as we're seeing it as an add on to the existing budget, it feels somewhat arbitrary to say. $100,000 um, without kind of trying to hone in with a little more detail on what exactly that position would do, what what that role would be, who would the ideal candidate would be, or and like not even getting ahead of that, but more like what what's the um, what what's the the benefit realized by the city to um, to have somebody in that position. Now, conceptually, I totally get it, 100%. I mean, but trying to, like, it, it just feels like if if we're going to approach this, then having a little more 
of a uh, of give, having given some more thought to like what the outcomes we want from that role to be what those outcomes would be and then sort of be a little more specific in terms of what that would cost the city this would be an appropriate salary this would be you know what every you know what it would cost the city to to add the position and all those carrying costs feels like i'm just concerned that it feels very just sort of like hey this is a nice round number let's just <laughs> let's just go with it when at the end we haven't even thought about what we want this person to do and what would the outcome would be from that work so maybe it should be 50,000 maybe it should be 200,000 i i don't know I, it, we just it's just sort of like i feel like there should be a, a level of consideration given to what if we're going to add that staff position what what the outcome would be do you so. want to address that sure okay. um so there's two two separate questions there i think one is you know what is the need and the responsibilities of the position and then the second one is how do we drive the budget number and we unless we have real hard information um, otherwise th this is a pretty good proxy for a fully loaded position um, you know maybe in the seventy thousand dollar pay range with benefits and those kind of things it could be a little low it could be a little you know we, we might have to go a little over this we have to go a little under this but this is I think I think in terms of a reasonable assumption for a full-time professional position, that's a that's a you know in the ballpark to get us going. Um, and then I think there's a further determination about you know then what level is the position, what are the requirements. But it's going to be in that range. So maybe we, maybe as we sit here next year, we'll say, hey, we saved ten thousand dollars in the budget on that position, or you know, well, we overspent that by twenty thousand. But it won't be by a hundred thousand, and it won't be underspent by fifty thousand. So I think it's like that's that. So that was the number we cranked for a position, which is essentially what we did with the economic development position as well. So yeah, it, and if I were totally, if I were ballparking it, then I would totally agree with you. A absolutely, that that's an appropriate amount, I guess. Since we're sort of sure as an add-on having a look you know making an argument to hey this is this is going to be the, the impact that it has on property taxes having being able to articulate that these are the we're just justify honestly that this is why we're adding this position we feel like this is why you know it will bring value you know i, I always struggle with this you know like when we throw around like oh it'll pay for itself it's like well how and when does when does that money come back? And 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 I, I just want to make, make sure we're justifying value around the position when we're talking about, you know, a significant um, tax increase. That's all. So anyway, so I, I, I don't have an arg I don't have a problem with the number. I think it's right on, you know, based on my professional experience. But at the same time, being I, I think it's worthwhile to give it some more thought to articulate exactly what the the return would be and how it would bring value to the city. Thoughts on that, but um, do you also have thoughts on that? Go ahead, Lauren. I, I, I think that's a great idea. I'm thinking about like a memo that maybe I would reach out to um, the Energy Advisory Committee. I know Kate Stevenson's been doing a lot of work, has a lot of thoughts, and there's also um, examples of other communities in Vermont who have done it. So I think we could even look at kind of salary range, and there's case studies that are written up and stuff about. Um, you know, that can give really tangible examples of what they're doing in other Vermont communities and how that kind of, you know, the, the types of energy efficiencies and things that are, um, you know, could potentially be found where you start to see savings to the budget overall and stuff. So I, I think that would be great to have available so the community could understand and wouldn't have to have followed our budget discussion um, from. <laughs> so I, I'm happy to help work on that. Um, so I also um, have had this same conversation with uh, Bill recently, um, and uh, so just a, a couple of things that we talked about, <clears throat> uh, you know, just in terms of what this person would be focused on and where savings could come from. Um, you know, we have this roadmap for the city specifically as to how we can achieve um, some of uh, some of these ideas. Now, to be fair, some of so. Um, 
nobody necessarily in the city is a uh, facilities uh, coordinator um, or, or specifically dedicated to facilities. <clears throat> and so a lot of these uh, projects that we are, um, that are laid out in the, um, in the roadmap uh, are going to take some kind of project manager that's going to take somebody to actually lead, um, you know, get it together and select somebody and, and make sure that it happens and happens properly. Um, <clears throat> so there's savings to be say, to be realized there for sure. Um, once we, you know, end up, uh, I mean, it is also going to take some further investment, right? Like if, okay, so, you know, we got to put in a, some kind of uh, pellet system at the water treatment plant or, you know, some, something like that, right? Um, so those are, th that's some of our thought, <clears throat> but then that's already um, kind of all been laid out for us, which is uh, very convenient. Uh, but the other side of it is is even looking at that 2050 piece, right? Like how are we engaging the, the community or are there policy ideas? You know, even Senator Perchlick this evening was like, you know, here's this policy idea. Or could, you know, could we be moving forward with that? Um, and so there's a potentially uh, space for um, creativity and innovation and, and public relations and, and policy um, uh, ideas for, for somebody who's in that role as well. So, you know, I think um, you can make a more direct correlation with savings as it relates to um, our facilities and projects that we may be taking on in the near future. Um, and then, you know, looking beyond that, like how are, how is this person actually helping uh, a resident, right? Like that they may be helping to, um, you know, if, if there's ideas about weatherization, like how do we get weatherization money into the hands of homeowners? Um, like, are there grant opportunities? Like being able to connect, um, you know, the residents with um, with these resources. That it's that's you know a potential. It's it's um, that's a little less concrete, but you know, I, at least, you know, at least the range of things that we were talking about. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question exactly, but <laughs> that's the, the, at least, like I said, those are things we were talking about. So. Oh, and my, to be clear, my, my question was not in uh, skeptical yeah, or in, <laughs> in, in any way, just yeah. more. I just want to be able to understand and yeah. tell the story and people ask like, hey, you know, this, this is going to have an impact on my property yeah. taxes just to be so that we have given some thought yeah. to what you know what the role would look like that, you, that's all it's not, it wasn't not yeah. whether there's value there i mean I, right. I absolutely agree that that there is but i just wanted to be able to you yeah. know tell the right how story. do you right um do you, do you think uh, a memo would be helpful I, I, absolutely i mean just yeah. to give some sense around how you know that this this person would you know, fit in to governance and, yeah. and what, you know, what their priorities would be and then how the city could, you know, realize value and, you know, and like Lauren said, with working with the Energy Committee, I think would be, I think that that would, yeah. um, and also I think it just, you know, it, it also then speaks to, um, you know, how we're, we're being proactive and, and, you know, working towards these goals that we've established as opposed to just uh, being passive and and waiting for that for change to happen, I think. So I think it's a, a positive thing on, on, from I, both directions. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Donna. Um, when we had this position in before, Kate Stevenson came in from the energy group, and she was talking about just all the projects that committee had directed, and that they were no longer able to do the in depthness and that not only would they pay back because they'd be helping us with vendors to do the jobs, but the actual jobs achieved would then affect our energy use. So I think, you know, Kate definitely can, I would presume something was written because at one point we talked about partnering the energy coordinator with the building facilitator. So we, never, we may not have gotten so far as any kind of job description, but I actually seem to remember, sorry to interrupt. I, I thought we got pretty long far. So I don't think to me it's it's a real concrete so idea can, we I had. Can, I can provide the history and let you know sort of where, at least where I'm thinking about this in the conversation I had with the mayor. And you know, this is coming from 
the group it wasn't part of our budget proposal so obviously we want to make sure we meet the goals of the council and MIAC and what we want to accomplish about this so I'm trying to learn as we go too but previously we had proposed I had proposed a, a, a facilities director who would also who part of their responsibility would be to deal with the energy issues and at that point we had more projects in our own buildings we've done a lot of them since then but it would be to coordinate our own energy saving projects those kinds of things they would also have been managing the parking garage which you know is going to happen and potentially taking over the whole parking system we hadn't really decided that but that was one option you know sort of the management of that definitely managing district heat um and and we internally have you know there's just a lot of facilities things with the elevator things that need to be dealt with and there's no for a while Steve Twombly was doing this um, we were contracting with him for an additional day a week on top of his assessing duties to manage some of that stuff and he gave that up I think a year or so ago and so we you know we we it's a, it's a capacity we just don't really have um, and we were moving forward in that direction I then changed that um, probably in, in informed the council I didn't do it in the darkness of night I'm not sure it was universally loved that I did it um, but when we hired Donna to be the public works director rather than filling a facilities director position because Donna didn't have the same kind of technical expertise that Tom McArdle had had going out we backfilled another technical person so that DPW retained the technical expertise and the idea was that Donna because she would not be actually out in the street managing projects would take on some of these energy related issues because she has that interest and expertise and that's worked okay okay there's no slight to Donna just you know she's got her hands full and so it probably is an idea that that didn't play out the way I had hoped it would um, so here we are and um, so I, I want to be sure that if we we you fund this that we have it be what people want um, and it meets the need and if we can combine it with some facilities work that would be great because it's a need that we have and I you know I so you know I certainly looking at the data <clears throat> Some of the things Kate mentioned was looking at our monthly energy use and those kinds of things. I think that's very important and we should have someone dedicated to that. Um, but it's not 40 hours a week either. So I think there's, you know, a lot of the things that have been mentioned can be done. Certainly managing district heat is important. So we, we could certainly use this position. I, I'm more concerned that you know, we don't suck up too much of it and not do what those of you that are advocating for this want. So, but we have some time, you know, this wouldn't be till July 1st. We have some time to think it through and make sure we've drafted what we want and all this. So, um, so that's a little bit of the history, a little bit of where I'm at. I did, you know, I talked to Lauren about it a little bit. I talked to Ann about it just to make sure I was hearing correctly what their hopes and dreams are for this and obviously what the council wants. Hope that's helpful. Yeah, there's, oh, um, actually before, before you go, Jack, there was one other thought I had. Um, I know people have made this claim, right, that the position would pay for itself. And I, I, I recall the first time we went through this discussion, um, uh, originally, uh, Kate was very reluctant. Uh, in fact, she never actually, she never said that. Um, and she was, in fact, very hesitant to make that claim, which I think was wise, um, because my understanding is that they can make their, you know, their salary back. Uh, but not necessarily, and even if they do, um, sometimes that can be short-lived, right? Like you might realize a lot of savings right away, but the de does that mean that it's not a valuable position, um, you know, moving forward, right? So um, anyway, just I, I, I have similar hesitations around that, that claim myself. <laughs> um, but any, it, like I do think it will save us money. <laughs> will it save their position? I don't know. Um, yes. I, I agree with what I just heard. I, I think that uh, when I was thinking there's $100,000 makes sense for that job, it's more the way Bill was thinking. You know, $100,000 is about what it costs us to 
hire an employee and and we've got time to design the job and design the scope of work i think you're right and that uh, the first couple of years we find the uh, the, the easy energy saving easy cost savings we continue to s develop uh, energy savings as time goes on is obviously we're going to have to if we're going to make these <coughs> intermediate term and long term goals but um, i don't think that means that we can bank on saving a hundred thousand dollars in energy expenditures uh, every year sure. but, but i still support having it in the budget um, Lauren, and then I actually want to go to some folks online um, who've had their hands raised. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'm probably the guilty one who mentioned how <laughs> there's examples from other communities where the, the position has uh, <laughs> saved more than their salary in energy savings. I totally agree with the conversation we're having. I mean, another piece of it to me is like, I really love the idea of this person being able to work with community members and and so it might not be savings that the city budget would reflect, but it would be savings that um, people in our community could be experiencing if we're helping them access incentives for clean energy technologies and things. And I wouldn't want to limit it to be, be so caught up in like, you've got to make your salary back that it might not open it up to, you know, a broader way of thinking about benefiting the community um, in addition to the city specific work, which of course would be a core function of it. So just want to mm -hmm. throw that out there. Thank you. All right, uh, Dee Dee Brush, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I, when I saw this in the um, uh, reporting of last week's city council meeting, I was surprised because it seems to me that though we all feel that energy savings and efficiencies are critical, I don't know whether this is the year to be adding it to our budget. Um, I think that some of the comments that one citizen had about the ever increasing budget in Montpelier, which makes it ever more challenging for people to afford, is a very, very, very real reality. And I wonder how much this position is needed in this particular fiscal year. And if you all vote for it, which I hope you don't this year, I also wonder how you are going to track the savings to individual homeowners and or business owners with this particular individual. I just feel as though there's no limit to what is suggested and what is voted for in Montpelier. And I do worry about its impact long-term on those who are living here now, those who might consider relocating here and starting businesses here. I think it's a very, very real issue. And I hope you will listen to this. Thank you. Thank you, Dee Dee. Uh, Vicki Lane, go ahead. Um, I, I can't, uh, all of those additions to the budget, um, you're at 7% effectively. I mean, 6.8%, 0.2%, forget that, it's 7% or 10%. Um, I, I just, I can't, I can't accept any of these additions as something that is desperately needed or something that is crucial right now to our survival during the pandemic. Um, and the increase, the constant continual increases to the property tax, I, you know, I don't know how I'm going to do it. And and the, the landlords just pass these things on to the renters. And I can't imagine, I, I, I mean, nobody can afford to live in this town anymore. Um, 
but we it you have no deletions to the budget. Um, I can look at a couple of them that are sitting in front of me because um, I can't scroll up on your Excel screen. But uh, you know, there's there's some deletions you could make um, in here, and you know, if you're going to add stuff, you need to take it away from something else. And I, an energy coordinate, a hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money for somebody. Um, I mean, you know, for somebody like me who's living on less than thirty thousand, who has social security as their main income. Um, that's a tremendous amount of money, and I don't see um, where it's going to get us anything, really. Um, certainly, as a homeowner, I don't see that I'm going to have anybody coming out to my house and helping me get a grant to weatherize my house. It's still going to be a drafty house. Um, I just, I, you know, it's get it. The town of the city of Montpelier is is getting to be a town of the haves. And those of us that are have not nots are suffering. And I'm getting I'm getting a little tired of people that are being paid off of our property, off of our tax money, and that includes government workers as well as anybody else, not realizing that they're being paid off of people like me's tax money. I'm paying for the, the pensions of my neighbors who worked for the state and got great pensions and stuff. And I just, I can't accept these constant, constant increases to the property tax. Um, I didn't catch the entire discussion of what was what the state was planning on doing or something to do with with state pensions and, uh, and it was going to be taken up on our property taxes. I, I can't agree with that. Um, I'm tired of paying for someone who's getting very well paid and very well benefits. Um, and I'm not seeing any benefits to myself. In fact, I hear a couple of my neighbors tell me how how horrible my yard is or how horrible my house is. Um, and I just, I do the best I can with what little I have, but I wasn't fortunate enough to work for the state of Vermont and have all of the pensions and the benefits and the whatevers that they did. So I, I can't agree with, with these big, these property tax increases. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Any further comments? Yes, go ahead. Steve Whitaker again. Um, I want to second uh, Vicki's comments and the prior uh, speaker. Uh, this appears to be a dance around the ads and not any real de deep inspection of where can we cut. I know uh, we hear that that happens in Washington. I don't have any evidence of that, but you, we, we, we clearly need a lot more than, you know, 14,000 for planning a radio system, or we can let people go ahead and do it without planning. Uh, having been trained as a schools and hospitals energy auditor, you're talking about three people's worth of work to take care of residential, you know, access to the big weatherization money that's coming down the pike to manage facilities and to solicit and, and do the math and help people, more people get on the district heat. That's three people worth of work. So I'm not advocating for 300,000 to be added unless you go and find 500 or 700 or 2 million to cut somewhere else. Um, I just think that this, you know, tippy toeing across the, the, the ads, like you're, you know, drunken sailors spending money. I'll, I'll go back to the analogy of, you know, college kids buying a new TV and beer party instead of paying the rent, you know, and you've been neglecting our sidewalks and our storm drains. We had, you know, 
flooding and, and nobody pays attention to this stuff. You're, you're letting our city, if you get out there and spend time on the sidewalks, you're letting our city go to hell in a handbasket while you add a lot of frivolous stuff. And I agree with the long-term goals and the long-term vision of energy efficiency and getting off of fossil fuels. And that's where the 300,000 should be three expert people helping to everybody bring their energy prices down and make better use of the district heat, but not by ignoring and just padding everything else that you've that's been carried forward. Y'all haven't in the last three meetings, you haven't scrutinized any anything in depth of where to take cuts out of. So the idea that you're going to keep adding things and not even add a meaningful amount to make sure our public safety communications work is uh, it's it's mismanagement. All right, thank you. All right. Any further thoughts from Council? Uh, Jack, go ahead. This is really an uh, overall observation rather than an observation of a per particular item. But uh, some people may remember that uh, it might have been 10 years ago or so the city did a series of workshops up on up at national life to talk about the future of montpelier and uh there, there maybe it was at uh capitol plaza but it was very well attended and a lot of people came out to talk about what they get from the city what they value from city government and what they would like to change and what, we, what they like to do to their budget. And everybody who spoke up and had a, an opinion, their, uh, their idea got put on the, uh, on the flip charts on the walls. And it went from, and there were all kinds of things, ads and, uh, and subtractions, including stuff like, we'll pay the city employees less, uh, cut this number of city employees, and, and a whole lot of things like that. And then we've all been, been through these, these exercises. Everyone got dots and they got to put on uh, next to the ideas what, uh, <clears throat> what they favor doing. And overwhelmingly, people were not supporting, you know, and this is a cross section of the, the city, people were not stepping up and saying, yes, I support getting fewer services from our city government than we do now. I think the people of Montpelier largely value the services that, uh, that they get from city government. And uh, the election results reflect that. You know, these, uh, the budget's being characterized as having a lot of uh, fluff or a lot of, uh, a lot of frivolous stuff. In fact, we're putting a lot of money into uh, into roads, just as one example. We, that's the thing we get a lot of complaints about, and rightly so, and we're actually doing something about it. And, uh, and I think it's worth recognizing. Now, we're gonna have uh, public hearings, and they're open for everyone to come and uh, <coughs> ask whatever questions they have and to make whatever suggestions they have. And if people do have suggestions for cuts, you know, the entire budget is, uh, is a public document for people to read. I'd welcome people bringing in those, uh, those suggestions, but uh, I, I don't think this is a proposal for, uh, for a frivolous budget. You know, we have, with regard to the energy coordinator, we have, uh, we have goals for 2030 and 2050. And uh, the only way we're going to make those goals is if we're doing work to reach those goals starting, uh, starting now. And, and if we don't, have someone whose job is to do it, that's probably not gonna happen. So that those are my overall observations about where we are in this process. 
I might also add too that arguably 2050 is too far away, right? Like we need to be acting much faster than 2050. And so, um, you know, when I think about when is the right time to put something like this in the budget, it's like last year. <laughs> um, but uh, actually, speaking of last year, our budget increase, our, our tax increase last year was what point? 0 0.6. 0 0.6%. Um, and just for context, so everybody has it, the inflation uh, rate uh, has been updated to what, 6.8%? Um, so just what that's, uh, you know, just some more context for folks. Um, um, you know, there, there is actually one other thing that I want to bring up before we potentially move on, uh, well, unless folks have more things to say, which is also welcome. Um, <clears throat> but I want to revisit the, um, stipends for committees um that is is that in that is in here at thirty thousand. um I, I don't know if folks saw uh we had an email from um i think it was jeremy Beaudry, um who was with us and i know i saw shana casper here um uh previously so uh I don't know if folks got a chance to read that email or consider uh, the numbers that they propose, but if folks had questions for either um, Shana or for Jeremy, I, I think this would be a, a good opportunity to. I, I did have a couple of uh, um, thoughts about the proposal that they brought, but other, other thoughts that folks might have about the committee, uh, paying committee members. Okay, there, uh, so just for context, their proposal, um, which looked like it went for more than uh, just, went beyond just the, the um, what I would call the statutory committees for the city, uh, their, their proposal um, landed at like 33,000, which is a little bit more than what we had, but I think we could probably keep it at 30, anticipating that not everybody would, would take it. Um, the only concern I had in the numbers that they proposed was that it included, and so I'm curious for your thoughts on this, Donna, and it included the CVPSA, which I was like, they're, they're, those aren't all our people, so I don't feel like we should be obligated to, pay, I mean, like, yeah. maybe for our particular uh, reps, but, but certainly not the whole um, committee. Yes, go ahead, Donna. Well, actually, because I was a little lukewarm on this okay. this year. And so when I read their thing and I got looked at the each committee, I was even less supportive of money for it. So, yeah. <laughs> sorry, that was my reaction. No, that's okay. I mean, do you have any thoughts on what you would either add or take away? Oh, just in, in general, just period. It, it literally made me think this is not the year for it. Maybe yeah. we need to look more thoroughly into what are our starting points. Yeah. Yeah, other thoughts on that? Uh, go ahead, Lauren. Oh, I was, I was just noting that oh. Shana oh, raised she, her hand. Oh, I see, might... yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Shana, go ahead. Uh, I can, we can't hear you for some reason. You look unmuted, which is very curious. I, uh, we, you, again, you look unmuted, but we still cannot hear you. Hmm. Okay, it sh we think it should work. Yeah, now you're muted. Yeah, go ahead. Is we think it might it might be on our end no we should be good we should be good maybe, maybe she sh could call you lauren does she have your number <laughs> <laughs> do you want to are you going to call okay great thank you And 
while we're waiting for Shana, any other thoughts on this particular piece of it? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I could actually go either way with this this year okay. if we're concerned about how high the budget is. Yeah. Just throwing that out there. Jack, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think I'm that way too. I think the the main value. I think I think the dollar numbers are kind of a mess. I think, or I, I mean, a guess. The uh, the main value for putting something in is that it would give us a chance to start finding out what's realistic. But I think it's fine to not include it this year. All right, can you guys hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. So sorry about that. Um, yeah, hi all, my name is Shana. Oh, I'm getting a wicked echo. I'm not sure if it's just me. I'll power through. Um, I'm Shana Casper, I'm the chair of the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Board on 10th Street. Um, and I just wanted to provide a little bit more context around this hearing that you guys talked about it last, uh, last week. So as you guys all know, the city of Montpelier just went through an 18 month long process with creative discourse of consultants, where we worked on figuring out how to make our city operations more equitable and more just. And one of their primary recommendations was to provide stipends for participation in city committees and task force and things to ensure a more diverse representation among participants. And this is you know, really an evidence-based diversity and equity and inclusion best practice to encourage participation and one that we practice for participation in focus groups with creative discourse as well. Um, so we, um, and I, Jeremy Beaudry is on the line as well, who really did a lot of the numbers crunching and I believe kind of shared some of that, that information with the committee earlier today. Um, but just, yeah, Montpelier has 23 active city committees with about 155 non-unique volunteer members that hold about 250 meetings a year. And these city committees, these volunteers are what help the city run. And wanting to make sure that we can make sure people have the things that they need to be able to participate. So compensating people for their time, as well as offering assistance for you know, childcare and food and transportation or other needs for volunteers to be able to attend these meetings. This, um, you know, proposed, we propose 42,000, but 30,000 would be a pilot project for providing $50 stipends for several city committees. We had proposed a few, but definitely open to more of a conversation. And the sum of $50 was just what was recommended by Creative Discourse. And there's not, based on my research, there doesn't seem to be a evidence-based number um, that encourages better participation. But, and we would budget for everyone in the committee to be able to apply or to have some sort of number where everyone could ask for the funds recognizing that those funds probably wouldn't all be used, right? So if every committee member applied for funds, we would need to be able to provide them um, or have some kind of process by which to go by to get that um, full amount of funds. So we are proposing that committee members would apply for this stipend. Um, and uh, if they hit a certain threshold, I believe it's $600 a year, they would then also have to fill out a 1099. And so kind of having this uh, initial pilot project to be able to see how it goes and to be able to get feedback and incorporate changes as needed. Um, we also want to recognize that the city of Essex is going through a very similar process and they are starting it in January. So we want to, we didn't put in a lot of specifics here because we wanted to learn about how it rolls out with them um, and learn more best practices. They're instituting it kind of across the board and put it as a line item in their budget. Um, and we'll be reaching out to them this spring and kind of building a more formal proposal. Um, but however, yeah, if you're interested in digging into more about the, these different proposals or the different amounts, um, Jeremy is also on the line here. 
um, and can, you know, dig in more on the numbers. Um, but I'll, I guess I'll pause there and see if there's any, you know, general questions about this proposal or, or other reflections. I'm yep. sorry I was having audio issues. No, that's fine. Go ahead, Connor. Hey, Shana. Uh, biggest issue I'm struggling with on this one is how do you pick and choose which committees are worthy of this, right? It's, to me, it's just as important that somebody could, like, serve on the, you know, design review as maybe something you would come to mind, like ho homelessness task force, like, you know, you, know, you, you, you think you want people uh, of all demographics represented, but, you know, I guess that applies to every committee. So I guess, like, how do you pick and choose in a way that's equitable on this? And how did you come to some of that reasoning uh, on some of these different options? Yeah, I think we were just more picking um, based on the, the names of the city committees, but not necessarily um, in a more strategic way than that. I think we would definitely be open to figuring out what would be the right committees to start with in this pilot project. And Jeremy, I saw you came off on video. Do you want to join us? Yeah, thanks. Um, if I could just offer a note about the process. Um, you know, when, when Cameron first ran the numbers for us with all committees, you know, it was a huge number, right, to make this widely available. Um, so the idea was to develop a few scenarios that could serve as a prototype, you know, a test case, to see, one, if this was an effective way to increase participation in city committees. Um, as far as the specifics of the, the, the pilot itself, I think that's where we would want council's input. Um, the scenarios we in here were just to get a, a little bit of a, a range of ideas on the table. Um, so, with respect to like how this would actually play out with committee, what the, what the algorithm might be for the number of um, positions that have a stipend, that's completely up to kind of design, um, and we would want to do that with your input, of course. Thank you. Um, other questions for uh, either uh, Shana or for Jeremy? Uh, Lauren, go ahead. I mean, just, just two thoughts. I mean, I think we also could think about setting a budget number and make it available to all committees and make it kind of first come, first serve, just knowing based on the data that, I mean, and make clear this is a pilot project and we really are looking to make it more accessible to more people to participate in these. Um, you know, I mean, if we had the problem where we ran out because it was like really popular and we were getting great participation, I think we could assess as a council how that's going and, and learn from it. It seems from a number of examples we heard, like often these pots of money are set and it's, you know, a much smaller portion is actually used. So I even though it looks like intimidating numbers and we have so many committees, like I actually don't think it would necessarily be a huge problem and just getting that data to learn from it. Um, I mean, I do just like the overall, like this is one of the few recommendations and, and maybe I'm misremembering, but it seems like this is one of the few where we kind of have to put our money where our mouth is that came out of the equity um, recommendations from our plan and it concerns me a little if we're not willing to put funding in to implement that plan like you know we've done some kind of low-hanging fruit stuff but I I hope you know I would just hope we would move forward with it I totally understand the the budget pressures and um, you know so it you know maybe it's even smaller than the current number for this year as like a, a short-term pilot um, I do think we have to set it up in a way that we can really learn like is this accomplishing the goal um, the goals that it's setting out and how do we measure that and I think the social and economic justice committee um, you know could put those details around it and I think there has to also be a much more robust outreach plan around it and other things that would have to accompany it so that um, you know it's so more people are feeling welcome and encouraged and even know the stipend is out there um, but I I would hope some form of this could move forward yeah um, I have a, a further question um, I, I mean, I, I would also like to try this in some way, even if it's more limited than um, 
you know, w what we have. But um, what, so my question is, uh, so just looking at the spreadsheet that you all provided to us, uh, you know, when I look at the, the highlighted uh, column that says, you know, for $50 per meeting per member, um, the total for that column, which, you know, that, that's the, the recommended amount, um, is 102,000. And so, but then further down, it, you know, it ends up at, at 33,000. Um, so I, I guess my assumption is that you were assuming a certain percentage of people would opt into this or, um, or, or really not, not take, partake of it, because if everybody did, it would be $102,000. Is that an accurate representation? Uh, and like, what percentage of people were you thinking would participate? Um, um, which, which tab are you looking at in the spreadsheet, just so I can be clear? Oh, I guess maybe I, oh, there are multiple tabs. Um, option C, I guess is what I was option looking C. at. But maybe okay, I, I should not be looking at that. Yeah, yeah, so, so that's, that's where the different scenarios, scenarios come in. Okay. Uh, oh, I see. Oh, gosh. There's so this <laughs> this is the most kind of complicated <laughs> algorithm you can say. So, in this particular calculation, I took uh, the percentage of people in Montpelier living under fifty thousand dollar a year income, and used that as my oh, percentage. See. The total number of committee positions that would be eligible. You know that would receive the stipend. Um, that's that's more of a complicated kind of approach. Um, I'd call your attention, I think, to option G. Okay. So, in this option, we went with choosing a handful of committees, um, and then taking the total number of members on those committees and cutting it by half. That's just a, a ballpark, which got us to that 30,000 mark with the $50 per position number. Um, so the, the, the illustration here is, you know, there are many ways we could design this pilot based on certain budget constraints. Um, and I think it could be a, a successful experiment to learn more about whether this can function well or not. Great, thank you. That is very helpful. Uh, Jay. Just a real quick question. Um, <clears throat> Kelly, I'm wondering if you're just sort of biting your tongue as <laughs> hard as you can as you think about whatever any of these scenarios and what the distri distribution apparatus and the systems that would be required to, to pay these things and when and how it would happen and, and what, what the impact on, uh, on the you know, city staff would be, regardless, you know, looking at these different scenarios in terms of complexity relative to simplicity? Um, well, since you asked, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, depending on, you know, which way council wants to go with this, um, you know, we can make that work. Um, and so operationally, I don't think it would be a huge thing to manage per se. Um, it definitely would, you know, take some staff time in terms of, you know, once the requests come in, um, you know, so that's one thing. And then if we did do a model where, you know, it's first come, first serve, then we would need to be monitoring the balance of that um, money. Um, so, you know, I, I think I probably could weigh in if I knew which way council was leaning. So I would hesitate to do that until I really knew what, what you wanted to do. Yeah, I think from, just to add on to that, I think the, the heavy lifting would probably be up front to, to define how the system's going to work. So whether somebody, when they, if, if it's optional, and someone comes on a committee, they sort of have to say, you know, I'm going to take this or not. I would, you know, we, we've had some conversations. I would think it would be something we wouldn't know before someone was appointed that shouldn't be a factor whether someone gets appointed to a committee. I would think if s there are certain committees that we're going to have this option and others that weren't, then that would be part of the advertising. You know, this is a committee for which this is eligible, this is not. Um, I said this last week and I, I would, I, I can't repeat it strongly enough. I think for, to get in, you know, I, I, you mentioned certain income levels. I, I don't think, we, we do not want to be into any kind of income testing, means testing for people at all. 
Um, this just has to be a voluntary compliance thing. Um, we don't have the ability, nor do we want to be looking at people's incomes. I mean, if someone, you know, it's just gotta be what it is. If, if it's offered and someone takes it, they take it. And that's just, uh, but I think mechanically, it's just getting W-4s from people <laughs> and figuring out, you know, how frequent do they get paid monthly, quarterly, whatever, you know, what, you know. How do we track attendance if they miss a meeting? Those kinds of, th those are administrative details, which, you know, could be bothersome, but um, probably the energy coordinator could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one other thing that, <laughs> that occurred to me is, uh, I mean, the way we get paid is via the ballot, right? Like there's a uh, sort of an assumed amount. And so, I. Uh, I know this is not really the, the same as uh, what's being proposed here, but you know, if we picked a, a few committees and said, you know, are they? Let's uh, ask the voters. Are they? You know, should we should we pay <laughs> the planning commission? Should we pay? Uh, you know, these different committees. Anyway, that's th that's another mechanism, which is. I mean, then then you're just paying them. You're not. It, it's not an opt-in, right. so you're not necessarily getting the different, um, you know, people who may not otherwise apply, uh, but but you might over time if they knew that that was available. Um, okay, any other thoughts on this? Yeah, Connor, go ahead. I, I, I would just sort of echo Lauren. I'd like to do something on this. <laughs> you know, we, we pay to have a consultant come in. Yeah. We hear the report. There was a very limited number of recommendations that come out of the report. And at some point, you know, is it just like writing a letter to ourselves, <laughs> having a consultant report come back if we're not actually following the recommendations that they put forward? Yeah. So, you know, I'd be okay in even limiting it below 30K, but I, I feel like we need to do something. That's do you have a proposal? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, um, so I want to acknowledge that um, both Vicki and Stephen, you've already spoken on this topic. I have not um, on and so, well, on the budget. And so, um, no, hey, so you're not calling up from your seat, right? Okay, that's not something you do. So, um, I, I just want to acknowledge that you've already had an opportunity to say something. Uh, I mean, I'm going to allow you to say one more thing, but only if it's short. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. Vicki, go ahead. All right. Um, there's, oh my goodness, there is an echo. Um, anyway, so I think. If, you're, if you have to pay somebody to be on a committee, you're not you're employing them, basically. And I think I found out the hard, hard way that the Department of Labor considers $50 worth uh, of payment to anyone for anything as something you have to report to them uh, as part of their process. Um, and, I just can't, if you're going to volunteer for a committee, you're going to volunteer for a committee. And I don't think it's fair to, um, to, to, to specifically call out certain committees. It's either all or, or no one. And uh, that's hardly a fair thing to do is to say that if you're on this committee, you get this, but if you're on that one, you don't get it. Um, that's just, and, and I'm a little tired of us constantly getting a consultant to tell us what to do and paying consultants to tell us what to do. So that's basically, I mean, I, I just, I can't continue to support all of this stuff. Okay. Thank you, Vicki. Go ahead. So I just remind the council that this came from the social and economic justice. This is supposed to be uh, a remedial step to more inclusivity in participation in this process. And I think that limiting it to the statutory committees is counterproductive because those are typically staffed by semi-professionals who, who don't need the money. 
but when you've got people you're asking to be on the, you know, the homelessness task force and there's various other uh, ha housing, et cetera, um, you want inclusiveness, you want people who have kids at home, you want people who don't have money, who, who are willing to devote their time to it. And all you're doing is giving them a stipend compensation. You're not, you're not paying them to participate. So I think that, you know, there's a lot more deserving areas to cut from to put 40 grand in the budget for this. Uh, it, it's a trial and error thing, and I think it'll pay off in spades in it, us not gentrifying this community. That's nothing anybody wants on their uh, resume. All right, other thoughts from council? Do you want to make any changes? Connor, I'd, I'd be comfortable with something like 20K until it runs out, see how it goes the first six months. If people aren't using it, you could adjust it from 25 up if, you know, if there's enough money left in the till until it runs out and apply it to all committees. Um, is that just throwing it out for consideration. Is that a, uh, yeah, thoughts on that? I just weigh in here. It's up to you folks what you want to do. In terms of, at this point, you're really just setting a dollar amount. You do have over six months to craft your policy because, again, this doesn't take effect till July 1. So if you want to have more time to talk about the program, you have, you have a lot of time to do that. So um, I'd suggest if you're going to appropriate a set of funds, do that and give some more don't try to make up the program on the spot yeah Shana is that a hand I know you had your hand up before go ahead oh that I was I just was gonna say exactly what Bill just said I think okay. um, doing something is really important and I think you guys have to ahead in the dollar amount and I think we can do some learning from Essex as they roll out their program and figure out more of the details of how to do it um, over the next six months yeah Connor, are you making, oh, Jake, sorry, go ahead. Kelly, remind me, we're, as, as it stands now, we're, it's at 30 is what we have budgeted, right? That's correct, yep. Yeah. It, it, so, I mean, I, I'm fine with leaving that number in. I feel like, te, you know, at this point in this process, $10,000 difference in, in overall scale. Um, and, you know, you, using the time to figure out, a, you know, making it available to all committees, but then figuring out exactly the mechanism and then sort of use this as a pilot because I, I agree. I mean, I think that this is a something that's a, a very clear and proactive step that we can that we can take to make um, um, engagement in the city and, and our committees uh, more inclusive. So I'm I'm fine with leaving it as is. Great. Yeah. Other thoughts? Did you want to make a motion, Connor? If not, that's okay. Uh, no, I'll leave it as okay. is. It's okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, if I, uh, so, so I will just say I'm comfortable with this budget as w where we've landed right now. If other folks are also comfortable, or if somebody would like to make a motion, one possibility is that. Oh, so actually, let me just back up a step. One possibility is that we have a lot more to discuss and we need the January 5th meeting as a budget workshop. Similar to what we did last time with the workshop where it's just us talking through um, changes that we might want to make. Another possibility is that maybe we're either feeling uh, like, like this is close to where we want to land. We, we can still make changes, uh, but uh, we could potentially um, have some kind of a motion that this is the budget um, to be put forward at the public hearings. Um, again, still subject to change, but um, it's kind of a question of like, do we need that January 5th meeting for a budget workshop? Because we, we really shouldn't change the, the public hearing dates because they've already been advertised as public hearings. So it's not like we can move them up, unfortunately, but that's, that, that's sort of a, a question I think that's where we're at right now. So yes. Do, do you want like a thumbs up, thumbs down? Yes, I want another one, or I don't. Um, 
sure, we could do a straw vote <laughs> of like, <laughs> would you like a, a, a January 5th budget workshop? That's where I'm at. Okay. Um, so is there a motion to uh, put this budget forward for the public hearings? So moved. I'll second. Okay, further discussion on this. Okay, um, seeing none, all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, thank you everybody. So I think that means that we will not be meeting on January 5th. Um, just so we're all clear about that. <coughs> um, and we have just a couple items left and we're so close, yes. Before you, before you leave the budget, yes. when do we decide how we're grouping the bond issues? Do we do that on the next two public hearings? So, uh, well, you could do it now. Um, so, in fact, that maybe some clarity around that would be helpful. My, my assumption, perhaps incorrect, was when you just voted to approve the budget as presented. It was, since we presented all the bonds as part of the budget, that it included all of those. But if you want to keep those up separately, that's fine. I mean, that would, that would be good. What will happen is, if, if you don't want to do that, then on ultimately you have to, so we have to have a public hearing on all the bonds more than 30 days before the, the town meeting. So normally we actually do that, we do two of them just because we do them in conjunction with the budget hearings. So there would be a public hearing on the 12th for all the bonds and for the budget, as well as the draft warning, and then a second public hearing on all of that on the 20th. And then you make your final decisions about what go actually goes on the ballot on January 20th, and that is the deadline. So that's the vote that really counts. That's the one that says this is what's going to the voters. So you can ho have public hearings on the bonds, you can hear about them and then decide you don't want to go forward with any of them or all of them or go forward with all of them. Um, those are your choices. Um, so you can, or if you don't, you know, if you want to pull any of them now, tell us now. Yeah, Doug. I just, I'm sorry I didn't make my question clear. <laughs> I was talking about their presentations of the bonds on the ballot how we're grouping them, not whether I included them in the budget mindset, but. So again. So, so if that's what later, that's great. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to approve the ballot on January 20. So ultimately, I mean, it would be nice if we talked about it on the 12th, but at the end of the day, it's how you choose to put them on the ballot on the 20th. I'm just not counting that the mayor's going to be here. So if, if she'd like to have input, I'm hoping her baby's going to be born by then. <laughs> and so I would like her to have input <laughs> on how it appears on the ballot because we all have our quirks about how we think things should be grouped within the bonding and how public responds to it. So I was just hoping to have a little dialogue of that before she might disappear. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. I also, number one, trust you all. And two... <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I, I'm happy, like, I'll be paying attention, um, so if I'm not also, <laughs> you on Zoom. <laughs> First time baby, <laughs> says I'll be yeah, that's probably <laughs> fair, that's probably fair, yeah, don't even know what I'm getting into, oh gosh, anyway, let's just say you're not, I mean, <laughs> you're not. <laughs> just in case, let's just in case, so you know you're not on the hook to, do yeah, um, <laughs> at least the, w I'll, I'll just say the way they were grouped made sense to me, <laughs> but if you decide to change it, that's okay. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just start there. <laughs> I thought it was fine. <laughs> oh, oh, goodness. Um, all right, um, anything else on the budget? Okay. All right, so um, let's, let's take up uh, the uh, cab vacancy, the community uh, Advisory board, community advisory board for the CJC, the, the Community Justice Center. Um, so that position had been uh, Jennifer, Councilor yes. Morton, uh, but had to step down. Yes. And uh, so we need somebody else to fill that role. Oh, Jack. 
one observation I was going to make. I know that uh, we discussed, or someone mentioned earlier, that we might be going into executive session, but these are, both of these things we're talking about are city council right. internal things. I don't think we go into executive session for that. I agree. I don't think we need to. Um, anybody um, up for that? I would like to say it was not a personal choice. It was a conflict of interest with my new job. Yep. And so can someone say what it's a oh sorry what, what it's in, what it involves and C you want to explain that, uh, yeah. Cameron? Go ahead. Hi, Cameron Niedermeyer, Assistant City Manager. So I go to the cab. So. I'm pretty familiar, and so I'll speak for them because um, uh, Carol's not here. So the CAB is basically an advisory board to our CJC. It's required by their funding sources to have that. Basically, we um, help the CJC determine what sort of public initiatives and public uh, communication needs to happen about community justice and and um, restorative justice you advise the cjc if there's any if she has any questions about policy um, for her grantees or her grants etc but it's really a, um, a group that tries to make sure that the cjc has as much community impact as possible and serves as a conduit between the community and the cjc it's a really lively group it doesn't meet very frequently um, they're upping that probably uh, to a little bit more than quarterly, but right now it is quarterly, um, two hours uh, a meeting. And uh, do these meetings tend to be during the workday or in the evening? They are after night, after five o'clock. After hours. Uh, Donna, no. I'm willing if it meets <laughs> that <laughs> infrequently, <laughs> even just once a month. <laughs> but if anybody else wants to take it. I don't know enough about them to, I'm not volunteering for that, sorry. Okay. Well, I like, as a mediator, I, I like that association. So. Yeah. Uh, Connor. I'd like to move to appoint Donna for the year. <laughs> she changes her mind. Got to jump on that. Okay, we've got a motion to second. <laughs> Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Thank you, Donna. Um, I I also once served on that board. It's great. So. Thank you, Donna. Yeah. I got an email today about another committee appointment, the Stormwater. <laughs> And it's not on this list. It's not on this list. Oh, and, and yeah. Well, but Zach thought there were some council appointments th when I was gone, uh, the yeah. first of, of November. It's a good call. And if none of you remember volunteering. <laughs> I think I might have volunteered. I I <laughs> no okay. idea. So it's you I two? I haven't heard anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. And there's some other errors here, such as the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority says no one appointed, and you have Doug and you have Justin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which hasn't been updated. So I can send those to Cameron, those corrections? That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, and so um, we have a council president, this is Jack, and we have a vice president, wh who I believe is Donna, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we currently have no parliamentarian. Uh, so, uh, Jack, you were the parliamentarian. At some I'm, I'm willing to do it again. <coughs> I don't know Fair if enough. there's any conflict. Uh, Are you aware of there's you any? No, I looked at it. it just I, the, the language in the charter is printed there. It doesn't necessarily, it says we have to have one. It doesn't really say they can't be the same person. Well, I'll nominate Jack. I'd like to second that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the only, I. Yes. Good. I don't want to hold up progress. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I will point out that the, pres the, the, the main role of the president is to run the meetings when the mayor is absent. Right. And in this particular case, we have reason to believe the mayor will be absent for a few meetings. <laughs> so I would point out that the person ruling on decisions of the chair would be the chair. <laughs> 
or advising on advising this. yeah so I, I just we should think about that yeah it's true I, I would just point out that the under Roberts rules when the chair makes a procedural ruling it's always subject to challenge right yeah and we have John Odom who is our really dependable <laughs> and it's subject to challenge by any one of the council. Is that right? I have this one this big for so dummies. What, what, what <laughs> is that? So just to be clear, the parliamentarian, their role is to help clarify uh, what the rules are. Uh, right? So, but anyone at some point could could say, you know, I don't think that's how the rule is, and, and order, actually yep. look it up. Right. And we right. haven't had that many parliamentary challenges. I just, yeah, we should just say that out loud. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Any other thoughts? I mean, the other the other possibility too is that it's it's not a bad thing to um, have somebody who is like training up in in that area. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. But I, you know, fair enough. Don't expect Jack to make errors. <laughs> <laughs> well, and if you do, anybody can challenge you. So yep. there we go. Um, further, uh, so I think there was a motion in a second even. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so further discussion. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, thank you, Jack, uh, for <laughs> your willingness <laughs> there. Um, all right, so, oh gosh, that is the end of our business. Uh, very exciting. Donna, are you good to start off with council reports? I am, because I'm just going to wish everyone Happy New Year <laughs> and hope that we all can have a good time in looking forward. And to best wishes to Anne and Zach, for your baby will be healthy and on time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ditto all that. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, fair enough. Jennifer? Good luck. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're, you're officially in any day now uh, territory, this so. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> Hope for all of that. Yeah. Um, definitely ditto all that. We'll be thinking of you. Thank you. And we will look forward to you being unplugged in January. <laughs> um, my, my only question is, should we be thinking about remote if there is really a huge COVID oh, spike right. in January? Like, how would we make that decision and um, notice it? And I mean, is there, do we, I, I hate, I know it's 1038, but mm. just. No, it's a good thing to bring up. It's a um, good question. Put it on the next agenda unless it's an emergency. We can put it on the next agenda. And well, actually the mayor can call an emergency meeting. Or I, so I'm going to assume that in her absence, the president can, and I know the clerk can. If the mayor doesn't, there's a circumstance. If that's, I think that's if citizens ask for it and the mayor refuses, then the clerk mm -hmm. can call one. I'm sorry, no, I'm just not hearing. Us. Sorry. So, the charter says the mayor may call a special meeting at any time. I'm, without reading it, I'm assuming that means the president may, in the absence of the mayor, and I think we should probably assume that the mayor will be considered to be on a leave of absence as opposed to just not being in a meeting. And it then it also says if citizens, I think there's a, if people want to have a meeting and the mayor doesn't call it, then the clerk can. It's just a, there's a kind of check and balance if the mayor's not, right. But I think in this case, we can tentatively put it on the 12th agenda and if we feel we need to have a special meeting, we could call one earlier. You know, it also occurs to me that uh, we could have, I mean, this, uh, we'd still have to have the space open, but counselors could participate <coughs> remotely regardless. Right. Um, right, and so f even as the counselors are remote, you could decide to continue that Correct. if, but then, you know, what are, what's the threshold? What are you, you know, basing it on? Um, that's a good question. And I think we, sh we should probably be watching the, um, what the legislature does, because you, you know, a year or so ago, they, they changed the rules to allow for solely remote meetings. 
and right now that isn't in case so we do have to have a physical location um, so the mayor's right we could you could all be remote right now as long as staff was here so yeah. uh, Uh, so, yeah, I guess I, I should say I, I anticipate being gone for <laughs> a couple of meetings um, coming a up. A couple, yeah, we'll see how many. Um, but, uh, you know, the fact that we don't have a meeting January 5th, that's helpful. Um, but, uh, so besides um, that and hopefully introducing a new human into the world, um, I also just announced that I'm running for mayor again, uh, oh. which I'm very excited about. <laughs> so I um, figured I'd better do that now before I <laughs> change my mind. No, I, I'm, I'm actually, like, I, I really enjoy being mayor, I, um, and I'm really hopeful that I can serve the city of Montpelier for another two years. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, I guess that's, that's all I'll have to say about that. Uh, John. Uh, just mention that, yes, I can call a special meeting if I receive a petition of the majority of y'all. So, um, and the only other thing I would say is I need you to correct, I misspoke earlier, we're not getting um, mail-in elections for August and November, we're just getting it for November. So, just because I put that out there okay. and I was wrong. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for that correction. Um, thank you. I would just like to say to all of you, um, and actually to the city staff, you know, this has been a really hard year, 2021, 20 on top of 2020. So thank you for your service. We, you know, there's, we get criticized and we have tough issues and they're not always readily apparent. And um, you've all stepped up and our staff has stepped up and I really appreciate that. So I hope everyone has a great holiday week and a half and takes the time that they need. I hope that the mayor <laughs> delivers a happy, healthy baby and stays happy and healthy herself. And we look forward to meeting your new human. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we, as much as we like having you here, we hope we don't see you till maybe town meeting day. <laughs> well, she'll be back before then. Um, <laughs> we'll see. And, uh, yeah, and so just happy holidays to everyone, and thanks, and okay. appreciate it. Great. Thank you, everybody. All right, so that is the end of our uh, business. So uh, I am going to um, uh, adjourn the meeting without objection, 1043. Thanks, everybody.